Good afternoon, everyone um, here in London and online uh, following us. I hope you're still all with us. Um, and this is the fourth and last session of what's been an extremely um, exciting and intriguing event. Um, I'm Eileen Orbashla. I'm a professor at Oxford Brookes University. And you will see there are several, a number of students and alumni from Oxford Brookes here today. And we're very happy that for many years now we've been um, very close with Intbau and, and sort of partnered with them on, on various initiatives. So, and we hope to continue to be doing so. Anyway, um, the, the theme of this session is how we build from here and who for, and we're going to move on to some case studies. And I think, you know, particularly this session follows yesterday afternoon's session on uh, materials. So we looked at materials. There were lots of questions asked yesterday. It was like, okay, now what do we do with these materials? What happens with them? How do they go forward? So I hope some of the speakers today will start answering some of those questions um, and make you think about what's going on and how you might sort of apply them and integrate them into projects, not just at building scale, but also a bigger settlement scale as well. Uh, I also want to remind you that there's the Interbau Architecture Challenge, um, and I hope you're all sort of aware of it. It's a, it's a design competition or thing to let you sort of look at uh, how we build, how we go forward, how you build low carbon, no carbon or carbon negative building, thinking about new systems and using the house as a sort of prototype um, and taking that, that forward. Um, and, you know, please enter, 9th of May is the deadline, send in your ideas, um, your projects, and really get the, the sort of conversation going as to how it, um, how it can help us um, and the world um, go forward. Uh, and I should also sort of flag up that there was, the, to support the architecture challenge, Intbau has been running a series of seminars. Many of you, I hope, have been following them, but if you haven't, they're all online, correct? Yeah. Um, and they're really good insights on both sort of theory, retrospect, uh, reflection, and materials. So please um, go online and, and do watch them. So, and of course, send in your ideas um, for the Inbound Challenge. Anyway, um, I'd like to introduce you to um, our first uh, speaker this afternoon. We have three speakers and then we'll have a break, two more speakers uh, after the break, and then a Q&A session. So again, I ask you to save your questions uh, for later. If you're following us online, please drop questions as you think of them as speakers are speaking into the, uh, into the chat box um, and they'll get picked up um, for the discussion. Um, but our first speaker is uh, Caroline Stanford from the Landmark Trust, and she's going to talk to us about rescue resilience and enjoyment through adaptive reuse of historic buildings and obviously the work of the Landmark Trust. Um, she's been the in-house research historian for buildings um, for the Landmark Trust, which is a buildings at risk charity since 2001. <laughs> Uh, and she's been an active project team member in Landmark's most challenging recent projects and understands many of the, uh, the hurdles to be overcome in delivering sustainable and creative new uses for difficult buildings that, left, that get left stranded um, in the one room. Uh, Caroline, over to you. Thank you very much. And, um Good afternoon, everyone. Well done for having the stamina to hang on in for this last session, um, or last last session of the of the Congress. Um, and thank. And so I'm going to present you with a case study of the Landmark Trust. And we are a British preservation charity that has built itself up over the last 50 years to become a leading force in British in British building conservation. And inherent in the, con in the concept of conservation is, of course, making the most of the energy already embedded in built structures. I'm going to illustrate Landmark's solution to pulling even the most ruinous buildings back from the brink and giving them new life and purpose. So let's begin with this proposition. In reality, whether or not a building's preservation is practicable is more likely to turn on economic pressures than the technical feasibility. Almost any structure can be repaired 
if one has the funds. And that, of course, is the essential proviso. But today, our brilliant architects and engineers can save almost any structure if they have the money. And I want to confess up front here that I'm all too aware that for many countries, what I'm about to show you will seem impossibly cosy and privileged and well-resourced, you know, the sort of the unattainable luxury of a stable and pros relatively prosperous country. For me, American anthropologist Abraham Maslow's theory of the hierarchy of needs provides a powerful tool to explain the luxury of such allocation of resources to heritage. This pyramid is probably already familiar to many of you, and it applies as much to a society as it does to an individual. And there's no doubt that what we at the Landmark Trust do belongs at the very apex of this pyramid. It represents the unavoidable truth that it's only when the other more basic societal needs have been met that a society or individual can afford to release resources for cultural activities, and perhaps even more so for the preservation of the built heritage. And we are indeed blessed that Britain is a country where such things can be achieved. So, here are just three examples of the 200 or so buildings that Landmark has rescued over the years. Each is historically significant in its own way. Uh, two of these are more than a thousand years old in their origins. There's no doubt our society would be poorer without them, yet what to do with such sites and how to give them a financially sustainable future? As they stand, they're trapped in negative financial equity. This graphic illustrates first, along the yellow line, the life cycle of the financial value of a typical building after its completion and purchase. After a little while, its condition deteriorates and its value dips. Then investment is made into repair and maintenance and the line rises again and so the cycle repeats. The green and then red line show a building falling into negative equity. If it is neglected and there is no repair, it rapidly slips below the line. Costs mount, the decline gets steeper, the deficit harder and harder to recover from. But sometimes a building has another kind of cultural value and it is this that Landmark is able to leverage to turn the decline around and meet the deficit so that a building is pulled back above that critical baseline to bring it back into financial sustainability. So what is the Landmark Trust? Well, we are a charity founded more than 50 years ago that specialises in the rescue and restoration of historic buildings at risk that will not survive without us. And we restore them for one purpose only, to find new future as self-catering holiday lets for the enjoyment of everyone. So, you know, there's no membership scheme. Anyone can book a stay in a landmark building. A landmark holiday allows people to experience and reflect upon all aspects of Britain's shared history. A building saved continues to beautify its setting and to enrich the surroundings of future generations much, just as much as the present days. And the far, past five, year, five decades have proved Landmark's formula as a robust solution for bridging the conservation deficit for smaller historic buildings. Like the National Trust and the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, Landmark began thanks to the vision of a few individuals notably this man, Sir John Smith. Um, health and safety regulations clearly um, slightly laxer in the 1960s. Smith, who cared very much about smaller historic buildings, hit on what in the 1960s was the novel idea that just perhaps people might like to stay in such buildings for a holiday and that the income generated could then be used for the building's maintenance. This was not a given in the forward-looking 1960s, however much of a truism it's become today. Smith had built up a private trust fund and used this to largely bankroll the charity for its first 25 years. By 1990, 
the portfolio had developed enough critical mass to stand on its own. And since 1990 then, Landmark has had to stand entirely on its own feet. Today, it must raise all its own money, but thanks to John Smith, it already had a sizeable portfolio of rescued buildings to cover the charity's overheads and keep the buildings themselves in good heart. John Smith founded the charity very cleverly as a social business model. The initial restoration of a building is paid for by charitable fundraising. The case made to our supporters as to why it's important to save this building. Once restored, it passes to, across to the holiday letting business and the income generated then pays for future maintenance and overheads. As VAT in the UK can only be charged once, it can be passed on to the holiday customer, which keeps our appeal cart targets and our restoration costs as low as they can be. The business model is not for profit, so if there is any surplus at the end of the year, it can be ploughed back into other restorations. By today, Landmark has rescued over 200 buildings across Britain, with a handful in Italy. Like any charity, we're answerable to a board of trustees, and there is a workforce of over 400 housekeepers and gardeners who look after the buildings on changeover days and they're managed by regional property managers. Our small head office holds teams for, for care of our historic estate, communications, development histor and, and finance with a furnishings team based in the Cotswolds. Some 40,000 people a year stay in our buildings, 365 days a year and we typically achieve year-round occupancy in excess of 80%. Now, enough word-only slides. The best way to give you a sense of our buildings is through images. So from my slides from now on, we'll all feature examples of our restorations. You'll see that it's the widest possible range of building types, forts, cottages, castles, banqueting houses, in short, all of human history in Britain is here. Landmark has always been a deliberately broad church, acknowledging that it can be just as important to save the humble as the grand. Landmark's criteria for selecting buildings are very simple, as you see here. Is it important? Does it need us? In other words, can it survive without us? And is it somewhere nice to spend a holiday? Even after more than 50 years, we still assess over 100 approaches every year. Of these, only two or three will be judged suitable for landmark use and be taken through to restoration. Projects can take years and years to complete. Acquisition can be complex, fundraising is always challenging, and the development of the architectural scheme to adapt and convert such historic buildings for modern life can also be challenging, both technically and in terms of regulatory compliance. Landmark holds its buildings in all the ways you'd expect. Many are freehold, thanks to the John Smith years, but today we can only buy a building if the money is externally available. More common is a 99-year lease at a nominal rent. Sometimes we enter a partnership with another organisation, like the National Trust or Historic Royal Palaces, or another charity. Occasionally, a building might be left to us as a bequest. It may become a landmark if good enough, but more likely it will be let residentially, the income again swelling the restoration funds. Since 1990, we fundraise from a variety of sources and have developed an experienced and effective fundraising team in-house. Our donors' support is critical, and they can give us anything from five pounds to half a million. We then work, we work hard to make sure that they feel valued and part of the enterprise, and grants from charitable trusts and foundations also play a very important role. Grants from the National Heritage Lottery Fund have enabled some of our most challenging projects. We can't count on their support any more than anyone else can, but we do by now have a good track record of successful applications. A crucial aspect for us as we try to build from here is the encouragement of traditional craft skills, both in the works we instruct from our contractors 
and through the promotion of work experience through our projects. This year, for the first time, we've sponsored our own carpentry apprentice. There is, as I'm sure you are all very much aware, a chronic shortage of building conservation skills in the UK as elsewhere, and there has been for some time. And unless we all encourage um, and, and, and revive these skills, our job as historic conservationists will become still harder. We also research all our buildings rigorously and spend a great deal of time thinking about their philosophy of repair. Sometimes we may restore some aspect of a building, but never without clear evidence. And we will always make sure that the new work is declared and honestly distinguished from the original fabric. The building's character comes first, and sometimes it can be hard to squeeze the basic needs of eating, sleeping, cooking and washing into a tiny folly. At a few of our buildings, reaching a bathroom requires you to tiptoe across a roof terrace um, or, or, a, even, or an outside terrace, but we know it's the sort of thing our adventurous visitors are prepared to put up with for a short stay. I'd now like to share with you a case study of a specific landmark restoration that perhaps particularly illustrates the theme of this year's Congress. This is Astley Castle, shown here before we started work on site in 2010 and two years later after restoration. This project illustrates the extent to which the embodied resource and history of even the most ruinous structure can be brought back into productive use. The moated site is an ancient one, lived on since before the Normans came a thousand years ago. There has been a fortified manor here since at least the 12th century. It became a hotel in the 1950s, but was gutted by fire in 1978. And despite being listed grade two starred, which in the British system places it within the top 5% of historic buildings in terms of importance, the castle then stood derelict at the mercy of vandals and became too decayed for conventional restoration. For Landmark's 40th anniversary in 2005, we sought an extra special challenge that would stretch our comfort zone and our expertise. And Astley Castle met that brief. Rather than restore it, our goal was to bring it back into sustainable use by dropping the best of contemporary 21st century design into the ancient shell of the castle. And we are extremely proud that the transformed Astley Castle won our architects, Witherford, Watson and Mann, the 2013 Stirling Prize for Architecture. This annual prize is awarded to the building that has made the greatest contribution to the evolution of architecture in the past year. In 2013, the field still included the European Union. Remarkable then for the prize to be awarded to a building conservation project, the first time this had ever been the case. We began this journey with an architectural competition for 12 invited practices. Witherford Watson Mann's entry stood out from the start for us respecting the existing profile of the ruined castle in the landscape and seeking to inhabit the ancient ruins while also celebrating their continued existence. The main living accommodation is on the first floor, site of the ancient Great Hall, and with bedrooms and bathrooms on the ground floor, and the castle sleeps eight people. Windows look directly onto a ruined atrium and the ancient church that stands nearby. The medieval windows frame views, other views across the countryside. From the architect's working model, you can see how three, the three massive walls are tied together by mighty concrete beams. And clearly the role of the structural engineer was also a crucial one here. Large spaces are left open to the sky, an atrium amid the ruins. And here is that atmospheric space, the surviving 17th century fireplace left intact and working for outside barbecues. 
clasped by a new build wall that makes no pretense of being ancient fabric. This blending of old and new in fine-grained detail is crucial to the scheme's success. The bricks are charcoal-fired and very carefully chosen to echo the colour variation of that found in the local red sandstone used to build the castle originally. The bricks were also chosen for their narrow profile so that new and old could be stitched seamlessly together. The architects um, did hundreds of drawings of brick detailing during the project. And here we are in the massive first floor room, much as envisaged from the outline scheme submitted right at the beginning of the competition phase. The furnishings too are modern, and yet the sense of age is as vivid as the contemporaneity of the intervention. It's a compelling and successful combination and a fine example, perhaps, of how conservation can indeed inform how we build from here, utilising and adapting the resource and embedded energy represented by historic structures to look forward as well as back. And I'd like to close with one final observation from the world of historic conservation on how we build from here. In the last month, another conflict zone has erupted brutally onto the world stage as the invasion of Ukraine unfolds before our eyes, placing it alongside Yemen, Syria, Iraq as a scene of military destruction. Whole societies can so easily slip down Maslow's pyramid, their concerns contracting to the most basic needs of survival and shelter. The loss of a country's historic fabric strikes at its very soul. How, indeed, to build again from here? What the world of heritage can teach in such situations is that time can heal. Here is another landmark site, this time Old Camden House in the Cotswolds. You're looking at the only remaining stump of a once mighty mansion completed for just 20 years before it was preemptively destroyed by fire in 1645 by soldiers fighting for the king in England's bloody civil wars. Even today, the reddened sandstone discoloured by fire bears witness to that past conflict. But note too the little banqueting house in the background, one of a pair that survived the destruction of the main house. Today, in Landmark's care, this site of past comfort, conflict has become a scene of deep tranquility and inspiration. In a society lucky enough to have the wealth and stability and resources, we are able to cherish our built environment, making it available to all, a glue that helps bind society together. Here, then, is the East Banqueting House, restored since 1998 as a place to recharge on holiday and safe, as far as we can tell, for future generations too. So what of Landmark's next project? How does Landmark plan to build from here? Well, in recent weeks, our latest groundbreaking project has suddenly taken on new res resonance. It's a control tower from World War II, an unlisted concrete shell on the very edge of existence. From here, as throughout history, brave young men risked their lives to defend their country and their way of life. And I've added here an A board I spotted outside an Oxford bookshop last week with this quote from Philip Pullman, one of the master storytellers of our time. After nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the things we need most in the world. It's a perhaps a simpler, more compelling version of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And in essence, it's part of what Landmark does, telling the stories that binds us together. And as we build from here, we must remember that buildings are where we play out our own stories, both individually and collectively as a society. We need them to tell us stories too, to bring comfort and forward paths born out of shared experience as we deal with an uncertain future. 
Perhaps this ultimately is the justification for an organization like the Landmark Trust, saving historic buildings as points of anchorage as well as enjoyment and the use of existing embedded resource. There's still much for Landmark to work through to decide whether this concrete shell, relict of our own most recent time of national conflict and destruction, can be saved. But even this shell still has a story to tell and a purpose to fulfill. And time and energy and creativity do heal. Thank you. <laughs> Caroline, thank you very much. That was a really inspiring talk, and if I may say so, uh, the Landmark Trust has always been at the forefront of sort of experimenting with both conservation and adaptive reuse. And um, again, if I may say so, it shows how the impact a small, or a relatively small organisation can have uh, across the field, and, and the way and the impact they can have on both the way we think about buildings and the way we use buildings. Because it, you know, it's not just what the Landmark Trust does; it's what other people have, and other organisations have learnt from the Landmark Trust and are implementing um, across the country and across the world even. So I think that's really worth noting and something we can hopefully bring back to the discussion. From England, we're going to go to Sierra Leone and our next speaker is Catriona Forbes. Um, and Catriona works as an architect and a project manager, builder and educator across Africa, Asia, the Americas and Europe. She primarily works with communities, teaching design and construction skills through practice to enable people to build more sustainably. Her approach is to use natural materials and build on traditional skills to create buildings and places that are appropriate for the 21st century. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I've been designing um, primarily for people who don't usually have access to architects and engineers. And um, in Sierra Leone, this is 80 to 90% of the population at least um, who are living in informal settlements. Um, and you can see that um, even this small area here along the um, coast is, is all reclaimed land from, from the sea and it's the, m the most desirable lands that people are living on. Um, they're most vulnerable to hazards um, and where the smallest interventions can make, can make a big difference. In Sierra Leone, there, is only a, there are only a handful of architects um, so it's, and there's no architecture school, so um, there are even fewer <coughs> architects per person than there are in other places. So these are the sorts of buildings that I've been constructing. Um, and using all the lessons of um, sustainable built environments that, and materials that a lot of the speakers talked about yesterday. So using natural materials, um, um, building upon local construction techniques that are already there, and using forms that are climatically appropriate and um, can be passively serviced. This is... Um, a computer lab and it's, it was for um, 16 schools that were in, within walking distance of the, the, the building and the parents already paid for IT lessons um, each term uh, but without a single um, computer between any of the 16 schools. So there was already an income that could be used for maintaining the building and running the building. Um, alongside that, the, they, had a, they wanted to have an internet cafe for primarily for the youth to use. And um, the plan was to, to run adult learning um, at the weekends and out of school hours. So it was really a project that benefited the whole community and it had a really solid business plan behind it. Um, the plan is really simple. Um, the, the more public use of the internet cafe and the classroom are quite clearly separated. And there's an open plan, um, small office reception area that oversees um, anybody who's passing between the two. So you, you get a certain amount of security and safety of the children and you get an acoustic separation um, in that plan. Uh, se separate um, toilet facilities for both. Um, and then a core um, 
where the store and the server room are placed. So um, obviously it was built by um, local builders and using low technologies, we didn't have cranes, um, everything had to be hand lifted. And we used this as an opportunity, as I do in all of my projects, to, to train construction skills within that community and that obviously makes it more sustainable because people who are there can understand the building better and how to um, maintain and repair it. So using, using all hand tools and building, like I said, building on the skills that were already available. Also, um, although this isn't very experimental in the grand global scheme of things, um, bamboo isn't generally considered to be a construction material there except for um, in a very rural context and in buildings that are, need to be um, rejuvenated every couple of years. Um, so we looked at how bamboo had been used globally and the, the techniques for preserving it. And, and so using bamboo on this building was actually a kind of a new way of using the material that people weren't necessarily used to. And also techniques like um, pre-building parts of the, the structure. Um, whilst you're working on the foundations, you can be building the, the wall, um, the wall frames and then lifting those into place afterwards is also something that people weren't used to doing. People are generally building by um, piecemeal and um, small parts um, joined together. Um, so the building is on a, on a steep um, rocky slope as are a lot of, um, I showed you the coastal area where there were a lot of informal settlements in, in, in and around Freetown particularly. Um, but also the other place where the land is less desirable and therefore um, less likely to be built on by, by people with, with money are the hillsides. And I, I don't know if you'll remember the, um, the huge landslide that happened in Sierra Leone a few years ago. Um, those are the sort of challenges that people are coming across with building in those areas and not having the, the knowledge to, to build sort of good foundations there. Um, so, I mean, there's lots of benefits of building up off the ground. You're allowing rainwater to run underneath. Obviously, if there's any flooding, then um, it's less likely to reach the, reach the structure. You're allowing cooling around the building. Um, and it also provides an extra space. And in this case, um, they were going to erect swings and play structures for, for the children. So it's an extra covered space. You can see it again here. And here, and in in the background there, you can see the the soil stabilised block core, um, and this was um, an important part of the building. The the computers that were being um, donated to the project um, didn't have um, separate kind of desktop systems. It was all brought to within the the server room. So that that space was. Um, attention to cooling and ventilation in that space was was essential um, so because it was built out of earth we we brought in the cool air from below um, all passively um, and we insulated the roof with um, insulation from old fridges because actually people don't generally use insulation in Sierra Leone now looking at been look, working on um, using reeds and plant material to, to create um, cells of insulation. But at that time, that, that's what we were able to find. You can see the core again here. So small use of concrete, essentially where it's needed, and the rest of the time use of, of natural materials wherever possible. And you can see the sort of um, diagrams that I used to explain how, how the building is ventilated, why it's being constructed as, as it has. Um, essentially the the roof has a vent all the way along and this is something that you see in a lot of the older buildings in Sierra Leone um, and it's a double skin roof so um, you can be uh, ventilating that space that gets gets most of the solar gains throughout the day um, and these are the louvres are a great invention that I use a lot, both vertical and horizontal louvers, and it allows you to cool a space even when it's pouring with rain, 
um, and even when you want privacy. And in this case, um, the louvres were, if I just go back to the plan, in this case, the louvres are all along the, the south side of the building. On the north side was a dirt road and um, a more public activity. So the louvres were on the south side and those were open to the, the incoming air. And these are the views of inside the classroom, which look very dark, but actually it's just the contrast. Um, and essentially, we, we also built the, the furniture because it was, it was important that um, the computers were set up perpendicular to where the light was coming in to reduce glare. Um, and it also allows um, uh, for sort of maximum airflow across people's bodies and out through the, the roof space. Um, so, what I've learned from all of these kinds of projects that I've been doing is that it's not, not just enough to satisfy the needs of people. Um, people have to want and believe in their building um, and the qualities and, and the aesthetics that it has and, and need to be proud of their buildings. Um, if not, the, build, the building won't survive. And the, the aspect of design that I found the most tricky and I've, I've seen so many um, buildings and projects fail on is the so social side of sustainability. Um, it so often gets um, overlooked or actually not deliberately overlooked but just enough is not understood about um, what the people who you're designing for actually want. So it's not just needs, it's wants as well and it's, it doesn't work to sort of say well people don't have anything so we'll just satisfy their needs. Um, I can, I could if we had more time, I could give you many, many stories of things that I've seen where people have been provided with something that ticks all the needs boxes, but actually, because people don't really want it or trust in it or believe in it or love it, um, it, it doesn't survive, it's not looked after. Um, so, I mean, in that project you just saw, I can give you a sort of taste of some of the, 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 the questions that I get when I'm on site with a project. It will start with, um, it's a hard sell every time and you just have to brace yourself with these questions. But you start, you start with, you can't use timber, um, what about fire? Um, you can't use earth because what about the rains? That might work in your country but it's not going to work in ours. Um, you can't use plant fibres because they're not strong enough. Um, towards the end when they see actually this is, this is really quite interesting and we like it. Um, it's only because I'm from the UK that I can do this. Um, somebody from this country couldn't do it. That's the sort of thing people say. Um, it must be expensive, um, but somehow still not secure enough um, because of the way we've built it. Um, and it can't be appropriate because an outsider has designed it. Um, but eventually people take to it and they start, you see people coming and taking selfies with it and it becomes a bit of a local attraction. Now, these are some of the ways that um, you know you can do needs assessments and workshops to find out what people's needs are. This is um, prioritising needs. Um, you know you can you can tramp around um, neighbourhoods for weeks on end, um, meeting people and surveying. You can hold big community and government stakeholder meetings. Um, you can do mapping exercises. But actually, what it boils down to in the end is people want, um, people's perception of, of buildings is important. Um, and in the context of Sierra Leone and a lot of um, um, glo the global south, showing sto status and wealth is, is everything. And people generally aspire towards a, a European or North American ideal, um, which of course, totally different climate totally different culture, totally different way of living, uh, just isn't, isn't appropriate for, for Sierra Leone. <coughs> Yet this is what people aspire to. These are all examples of places that people um, want to live. And this is where people are working. Um, and you can see that you need to have air conditioning units in a country where there's um, a very unreliable power. Um, you can see that the um, daylighting in the in these classrooms is going to be um, pretty poor with these this is these are the windows here but um, we're going there trying to talk to people about 
um, building sustainably when actually a lot of people are only able to think or, um, a day ahead in terms of um, you know, where's the next meal coming from and things. And we're talking about sustainability. And we're also looking back at the types of materials and architecture that um, has been built for thousands of years and is considered to be poor man's um, um, buildings. People don't want to go back to this. People are moving from rural situations to urban environments. Why would they want to go back to this kind of, these kinds of buildings? And then the other type of um, buildings you have there, which are in fact a bit of a um, climatically appropriate masterclass of the um, colonial buildings built, built by the British when they, when they colonised Sierra Leone. And although they have a um, very sort of negative image to them because of their past, like I say, they do have so, so much about them that we can learn valuable lessons from. Um, and although we don't want our buildings to look like this, if you understand how those features work, then um, you can bring some of that into the 21st century. Um, so people don't really want any of this. And this, this sort of led me to think, well, how, how are we designing? Um, and I realized that to have a greater impact, we, we really need to be um, improving on the social sustainability of the built environment and rethink our roles as architects. Um, and, and so I looked at what, what do I know or what does an architect know? Um, and this includes the handful of Sierra Leonean architects. We, we know about thinking logically through a problem um, and I think that mostly comes down to practice. We know simple science behind designing climatically appropriate buildings in a tropical context. And as I think I demonstrated in the, in the example there, it's not rocket science. You're, because you're trying to keep the energy demands low, you're not using lots of sophisticated technology. You can sort of see and feel how it works. Um, a lot of it is based on um, things like the stack effect and um, the fact that hot air rises, the fact that when you're in a humid environment, you can't, it's harder to cool your body down because the, the air is so saturated with moisture. So the way that you can feel cooler is by having um, air moving across your body. So even if the, you know, a thermometer is telling you that it's not cooler, if you've got that air movement, then it can feel a lot cooler. So it's really simple um, science and it's easy to demonstrate. Um, we know about properties and the mater materials, um, the potentials and the challenges, and this is about um, e experiencing it, feel it, feeling it with your hands, um, and, and having um, worked with those materials. And then if we don't know something about material, we know where to go to ask questions, um, and we know how to ask those questions. So with the bamboo that I showed you previously, I made a lot of contacts with people in Ghana where they are using bam bamboo extensively and um, um, took some of their sort of lessons learned about how to use the material. Um, and what's possible, um, one of the difficulties in Sierra Leone is there are very few examples of what, what it's possible to do with natural materials, except for those buildings that are in, a, in a, those um, vernacular architectures. Um, so knowing what, what's possible to do with, with materials. And I always really enjoy giving presentations there where I show sort of multi-story timber buildings and um, you know ancient earth structures that are several stories high because people are just amazed by it. And it just opens up. Um, when you know the possibilities, you can sort of aspire to do, do things differently. Um, and then we know how to, and this is a lot of what architecture school teaches us, communicating our ideas verbally and in drawings and in models. And again, that's about practice. But what do the, the end users know and the, essentially the builders know in these, in these kinds of um, um, neighborhoods? Um, the builders are, they are the end users there. There's, there's, there aren't builders coming into those neighbourhoods to build people's houses. It will be their brother or their uncle or their um, father who's building. Um, they, people there are already incredibly resourceful um, and they know how to work cost effectively. I don't need to teach anybody that. Um, 
people know everything there is to know about their physical and, and climatic and social challenges in their neighbourhoods and this is where we fall short um, because our experience of a place um, can be so incredibly different from um, somebody who lives lives there and has always, always lived their experience of the place. So I remember very early on when I went to Sierra Leone, um, we designed a building and um, I tried to keep it as cool as possible, even at night. And people just found it too cool, whereas we would be sweating away. Um, people were saying, oh no, it's far too cold at night, we're all gonna get ill, kind of thing. Um, so that's a really basic example, but um, people know better than we do. Um, they, they, the builders already know how to use their tools and materials that are available. They know to, where to source the materials, and they know how to maintain and repair the buildings. The most important thing, I think, is that they know the subtleties of what people consider to be desirable, comfortable and acceptable. So they know, they really do know what people want because they themselves know what they want and they're essentially building for their neighbours. And um, the added benefit is that they know how to pass on their knowledge to others through their networks and word of mouth and how to show examples. Um, they know how to get their future clients and they know how how to get the best out of their co-workers. So usually the kind of, what, what we do as architects is we try and download as much of this information on the right and form a design brief and the designing happens over there with, with the architect. But what I wondered is, what would you be able to um, move um, the knowledge, transfer the knowledge in this direction? And wouldn't that, um, the result of that be a much more sustainable um, environment and the best thing about this is that these builders are the best advocates for sustainable buildings um, nobody's going to go up to them and say you, you don't understand how things work here um, if they understand it and it works and they build it for their houses then why isn't somebody going to ask them to do it for, for them so to me it seemed like um, an interesting and um, worthwhile thing to, to look into so actually something I didn't tell you about that building that I showed you is that I wasn't really the one that designed it. Um, this, is, this is the first iteration of the plan for that building and it was drawn up by a team of um, builders who lived in that community, um, mostly young guys who Unfortunately, just guys, I try to encourage as much as possible women to get involved. But the guys are already one, the ones that are building. Um, and, you know, they'd be using the internet cafe. Their kids would be going to use the classroom. And then also um, three or four um, engineering students from um, the university in Freetown. So they made up a team and we encouraged... Uh, just making and being as creative as possible initially. One of the huge challenges that I found and didn't really anticipate, anticipated a bit, I would say, but not to the extent that it happened, was um, the, the way that people are schooled in Sierra Leone is generally through rote learning. So in incredibly good at remembering information, but um, not very good at thinking creatively and outside of the box. And it's understandable because if you make a mistake or ask a question that's deemed to be silly, you're usually embarrassed or beaten at school. So people have had it kind of knocked out of them by the time they, they get to adulthood, unfortunately. And what was interesting is that the, some of the builders hadn't been to school at all and were illiterate and had very low numeracy um, skills. They were actually some of the best students because they still had that sort of creativeness in them and were, were able, didn't have something sort of holding it back. So there was a lot of encouraging people to use. We used found materials. This is marshmallows and spaghetti doing some engineering. Um, and then I, I sort of lost it at one point because everyone was just doing boxes and straight walls. Not that that's a, not a good way to design and build, but I wanted people to sort of be a bit freer. So I imported some plasticine um, and got slightly wavier walls. Um, so we did spend time studying the um, colonial architecture, not because we wanted buildings to be, again, to look like that, but if you, if you can understand why the features of these buildings work so well, 
and did work so well when there, were, there wasn't any um, electricity, then you can see how you can transfer that into um, today's context. And this is um, the old university building built out of laterite stone, another one of the buildings that we studied. So we went on an architecture tour one day around Freetown. And we look, um, this is a school building that was built with soil cement blocks. And um, we showed the students, the builders and engineers, um, the features of that and how that worked. And we also went up to the university and looked at 60s, 70s buildings, not all of which were entirely successful but again just encouraging an analysis of what's there and understanding why things have been done as they are and what works and what doesn't work um, these are the Sierra Leone is incredibly rich in natural resources and these are some of the materials that we have to work with hemp um, we've got great granite stone we've got um, lots of different fibers bamboo um, great great earths um, and we Taught, taught ways of t simply testing the properties of those, those materials. And we made <coughs> rammed earth samples and um, did soil tests in bottles, did clay pasta samples. And these are all clays from different, clay soils from different parts of Sierra Leone, and these are natural colours. Um, and then the students, we had, we had whole days dedicated to each one of those, not each one of those materials, but some of those materials that you saw. So this was the Earth Day where you know, we actually worked with the material and felt it and understood its properties better. We also did simple things like putting an earth block next to a piece of metal sheet in the sun and just feeling what the temperature of that is in the shade behind that material after, you know, an afternoon of sun. It's things like that. You can sort of stand up and talk about them all you like, but um, people, it's, it might not sink, sink into people, as well as if you actually sort of demonstrate it and people feel it for themselves. And then we encouraged um, the, the students themselves to do some teaching. There's quite a hierarchical society there. And um, we wanted this, these sort of cross-disciplinary teams to, to, to be truly that and for people to realize that there's a lot of knowledge in country and it can, can be tapped into if you sort of break through those hierarchical um, boundary. So we had, um, this is Musa who grew up in a village very close to where we were doing the earth. He hadn't been to school but was just an absolute expert when it came to, to earth and he was teaching about that and then the, Emmanuel taught basic quantities, um, quantity surveying and over six weeks that um, the plan for that um, computer lab was formed and the team had to go, went, went through, um, led by me and, uh, and other construction professionals, went through the process that we would go through as an architect in a very quick way, but they did all the site analysis and the measuring and the mapping themselves. Um, they held community meetings and had the same sort of questions fired at them and had to, had to answer those questions based on what they'd learnt. They learnt to do scale model making and drawing and you know, I was very surprised that even that some of the carpenters there had never picked up a pencil and drawn in their lives. They picked up a pencil to mark somewhere where they were about to do a cut, but aside from that, they'd never drawn anything. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of um, making models to scale. Um, that's one of them. There were three projects that we, we designed on that, on that particular course. And then we, we ended up, you know, doing things that you would see in an architecture office where there were scribbles on a wall and we were all sort of talking around it. And I was just um, s actually so amazed by what we managed to do in those six weeks and um, um, when you think of, of where people had come from. And these were the final presentations at the end of the six weeks, which I don't think would look too out of place in a first year um, crit um, situation in the UK. And this slide just sort of um, sums up uh, the whole process. This was one of the other buildings, which was a clinic. Um, so this was the team of builders for that one that designed, there's their scale model. They then built it um, themselves. And that's the, it's a, sorry, not a clinic, a birthing center. Um, so in conclusion, 
If we want to address the challenges posed by rapid urbanisation and building shortages in the parts of the world where the populations are the fastest growing, the physical conditions are least desirable or favourable, the design of the built environment has the greatest potential to be hazardous, there is the greatest lack of access to design knowledge, but ideas travel quickly through word of mouth, people build by copying, and construction takes little time, and we want those buildings to be socially sustainable as well as in environmentally and economically sustainable, then I believe that our role of architects should be to teach sustainable design skills to the people um, who are already trusted with the building work and to assist with the construction of buildings that demonstrate sustainable design solutions. So what you've got there is you've got people who understand um, how to design and build sustainably with the materials that are there and you've got examples of how this actually works in practice and then you've got very dense, densely um, built informal settlements in, in dire need of um, you know, good foundations, different drainage solutions that are all to, the, to what's already there to prevent flooding, um, s solutions to prevent the, sp the spread of fire and those sorts of things. People are, are sort of hundreds of thousands of people die each year in Sierra Leone because of fire, flooding and landslides and it's sort of simple things like the design of a foundation or the design of drainage channels or whatever that could make that difference and so you've got people who are living in those informal settlements who would then have the skills to to deal with with some of those problems um yeah thank you Thank you very much. That was hugely inspirational. I'm sure, I know it was an inspiration to our students, and I hope it was also an inspiration to all of you students around the world who are sort of watching this online or catching it later. Um, I think there's a lot to think about. And one thing that's coming through to me over these two days is that our problems are global and our solutions are global. It's not one, you know, the global south needs this type of solution, and, you know, in the west we're going to have these sort of solutions actually you know, um, we've been hearing, you know, building with earth, for example, can be done anywhere and could be and must and should be the solution using sustainable materials should be the solution everywhere, not just one hoisted on certain certain communities. And I think, you know, maybe we can carry this forward to the discussion at the end of the session is that, you know, there's a huge amount we can learn from Sierra Leone, not just what they can learn from us or that way but I think you know I think you've really reflected on how we can be learning lessons from the way they practice and the way they use materials um, and and also um, convey information you know it's not just formal education it's many other ways of transmitting knowledge and, and we need to look at how how those things happen and how they can be transposed um, to other um, other systems as well there's no, there's no saying that our system is the right system um no way at all so our third speaker this afternoon is Letty Strake, and she is going to talk about the work they do in practice architecture on party as methodology and on-site intuitive design Letty uh, co-founded practice architecture with paloma gormley in 2009 practice architecture work in a hands-on and collaborative way with users and clients to develop designs and bespoke building strategies. And Letiz has a particular interest in designing projects with those who will build them in mind. So again, just a good example of, of working with um, people and how they're going to gain the skills to do so. Letiz, over to you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's so nice to be here today. It's been like really moving and inspiring. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about what we've called Osid and Pam, and they're not things that we've discovered. They're just things that we needed to name in order to, to do them. Um, so, uh, yeah, I spend my time between three different organisations. So, yeah, the first is Practice Architecture. So top left is a, a cafe that we built um, 13 years ago. And more recently, this is Flat House that we built near Cambridgeshire. Um, the second is I teach a master's studio called Studio and Process in Sheffield, uh, which I feel very lucky to get to do. It's a really amazing school. 
Um, and the third is Staying Out, which is um, a, a queer collective who put on parties and events, um, mainly in London, but around the country. Um, but I also like to build stuff. Sometimes I just work as a builder on other people's building sites. Um, I do some set design, um, and I've been a play worker, a sessional play worker in playgrounds, and end up working with young people. And I think I'm slowly realising I'm quite an impatient architect. <laughs> There's a kind of theme to to lots of what I end up doing. Um, so yeah, firstly, practice architecture. So uh, yeah, I think we yeah. I was thinking about our early projects. A lot of them are congregational spaces, places where people come together. Um, uh, and more recently, we've got an interest in low embodied carbon materials as our buildings have started to get slightly more solid um, as the practice has developed. Um, so yeah, this is Flat House, which is, so I'm going to say, yes, yeah, so I work with Paloma and she's obsessed with low embodied carbon materials and hempcrete. And so she, she led the design of this, which is Flat House. Um, but common to our early projects and later projects and both how Paloma and I like to work is an interest in the construction process and um, enjoying the construction process and the relationship with the people that are building um, our structures. Um, so yeah, this was the first house we did, which was the first building that had to be warm and dry and meet building regulations. Um, and our, yeah, we, we, we just got to work really cl closely with the people building it who also fed into the design a lot. Um, so that was a house in Greenwich. Um, and then, yeah, that, lots of the lessons we gained from doing that self-build project translated into this, which was trying to look at prefab uh, hempcrete construction. Um, that's Oscar up there, who I get to teach on my course, who's a builder. Um, and so, yeah, Paloma, through her interest, has now co-founded with Summer Islam another organisation called Material Cultures, which is part research, part design, part building, looking at how to influence kind of larger scale mainstream construction methods with low body carbon materials. Um, but in terms of my interests, I've kind of carried on the thread of smaller, I'm, I'm more interested in smaller scale projects that aren't kind of technologically um, meeting some of the challenges we have, but I'm interested in the co-production of spaces. Um, and again, that's slightly more impatient <laughs> end of production. Um, so yeah, I've, um, this is a slide I show my students, but thinking about the pluralist approach to the climate uh, crisis that we have, um, so many kind of strategic and large scale solutions, um, technological responses, but also uh, yeah, local and interpersonal, like how, what relationships are we forming to create the, the worlds we want to see? And so this is, these are conversations I have with my students um, a lot. So how can we develop method, methods of practicing which don't serve to echo or reinforce oppressive, destructive, systemic power dynamics, which I would say have contributed to a lot of the situation we're in, whether it's patriarchy or colonialism, um, kind of congealed with capitalism, I think have gifted us a climate emergency. And so how can we find ways of relating to each other, which can kind of propose other ways of existing together, co-producing our environments together, um, so yeah, as Audrey Lord says, the master's tools will never d dismantle the master's house. Um, and then also to kind of joyfully do it, how can we demonstrate the world that we want to live in through, through the processes of building, um, which I've recently learned is called prefigurative politics. Um, so Osid and Pam. <laughs> so Osid was a, a term that Paloma, Henry and I came up with um, the first project we worked on, but actually, first I'm going to show you this, which isn't ours, but it's really important for me because it was the first, so Paloma and I rocked up on site here, I think it was either 2007, 2008, and it was a temporary Lido in Waterloo, so just over the river, and Exist, who are this collective from across Europe, occupied this space and built a Lido for the summer. Um, and I'd never used power tools before, um, but it was such a magical uh, place to spend time and just show up and, and learn these skills. And also, really interestingly, the, the first thing they did when they arrived on site was build some bedrooms, um, a kitchen and a sauna. So also thinking about their own well-being in terms of the creation of that space. Um, and I really think that the kind of spirit of the build carries into the spirit of the occupation. If people have had a good time making something together, I think often that's legible in, in what you end up with. Um, so yeah, this is Frank's cafe. Um, so I'd, I was doing my part one, Paloma was still studying and she 
said, oh, we need to, uh, my friends asked us to make this refreshment area next to a sculpture park on the, the roof of a car park. Um, but we got really carried away and designed a structure and sent a kind of raggy sketch up model back and forth um, uh, and ordered some bits and pieces. Um, and then 300 scaffolding boards arrived at the bottom of the car park and uh, my work kindly gave me three weeks off to build this cafe and we just kind of called everyone we knew to say come and help um, and so yeah we kind of lived on the roof of this car park for three weeks got a lorry company to make the roof um, and there was just a lot of collaborative problem solving um, we really didn't know what we were doing <laughs> um, you know there were some skills there but the kind of uh, you know the the yeah in terms of power tools the skills just kind of spread around the site and you know, we just hadn't thought stuff through, um, but the, the, the problem solving techniques we came up with um, were really valuable for me. And then also this is kind of where I get into OSID, so on-site intuitive design that we ha I did that for planning. Um, so my office let me use their computers to put it together. But, you know, that's not exactly what was built. And a lot of that's because we were there on site and could make judgments about like how wide does the bar need to be or maybe you should make that bench a little bit longer because it kind of feels better in relation to that view or that person over there so we could kind of make these one-to-one -one judgments with our bodies um, but also importantly the people who ended up running the cafe and the kitchen were there as well so we were all making those judgments collaboratively together um, which is a real privilege because as architects usually we've got to wrestle it all out in models and drawings so um, we we're really lucky to get to do it uh, in person and yeah, kind of furniture just started appearing as we went along um, and yeah ended up with this cafe um, so just want to talk a bit about the yard theatre which we did a year later um, so Jay was a theatre director and approached us he was really frustrated that there was nowhere cheap for directors and theatre producers to put on theatre in London and that kind of compromised how experimental theatre could be so he said I've got this warehouse you know do you think you could help and um, we came up with a concept for you know having a bar and a theatre did have a sketch up model again for the primary structure and we had an idea of the build up and got some advice on acoustic separation but again like so this big structure got shuffled around for a whole afternoon based on people kind of being the, the performer shuffling chairs around like feeling what that relationship was to the back of the stage um, and again had people who were going to run the theatre there with us just all of us judging that together um, and so in three weeks and for seven and a half grand we built the yard um, it was exhausting and at times stressful but um, uh, a, re a really amazing process and again lots of detailing got decided on site stuff that you might wrestle over for hours in a CAD model could just be kind of done one to one um, and it was meant to be there for three months and it's still there 13 years later and 12 years later and now has over a million pounds of funding for a new theatre um, from the GLA so um, but yeah there's kind of opportunity in the temporary you can be slightly more experimental with stuff and I think what we just heard from the last speaker that people become kind of invested in those spaces and I think some of the quality of the process of building is legible in that space you can kind of feel that people built this and had an interesting time doing it and again that thing of agency so the people that then run that space they know the build up of the materials and it's changed a lot since we built it and it's been repaired in various ways and extended and changed and the people that run that space feel like they have the agency and knowledge to to do that and ownership to do it as well you know it's not it's it's ours um so yeah so i'm interested in building as a creative process um and space shaping in situ Ooh, there's nothing there and now i'm going to move on to party as methodology um which is a more recent acronym that I came up with with my students and so I'm less used to talking about it, and it might be slightly more theoretical at this stage than OSID. Um, but I guess it's this experience of events and parties happening along, happening, happening along the journey of design and build um, to test things spatially, but also build relationships. Um, 
so yeah this is a tree house I, I lived at a school called Summerhill which is a kind of mad democratically run school in Suffolk and I lived there for a couple of months um, with my friend who's the art teacher and built this tree house and so this is just like a mini version of Pam um, so yeah we found worked out where it might be and the first thing we did was made the fire you know the hearth of this place and had some fires and events and parties uh, around this fireplace um, and furniture would move around it and that's where I kind of feel like everyone's an architect we can all make those spatial decisions um, well you know maybe not architect but you know what I mean and you yeah, make those judgments with our bodies um, and this was a halfway celebration where some of the parents came along um, and kept building and uh, yeah so then decisions again like the stairs just how they hug that fireplace um, could just be made on on site um, and yeah that's it the opening party um, but yeah so again opportunity in the temporary and event and um, so potential for programmatic and spatial testing relationship building um, and remembering what it's all about um, I think is Good to be doing so yeah this is the studio I run in Sheffield called Studio and Process um, and what I encourage students to do is not just to think about the final product but part of their proposal has to be how you get there whether it's a co-design process or who's building it or the kind of narrative of the architecture coming to be and crucially what your role is um, in that so I managed to get the keys to a warehouse just before Christmas and just said <laughs> it was a big risk but the school backed me and just said the brief is have as much fun as you can in this space for the next three weeks um, they hosted a life drawing class and invited the whole undergrad um, this is a life drawing class and annoyingly I think I missed out a photo of the amazing fashion show they put on at the end where they all made clothes out of waste materials and had a competition and um, it was a very joyful event and, and I'd say piece of research <laughs> Um, and yeah, so this, I'll just talk briefly about the project I'm working on at the moment, which, so I said to Harriet when she asked me, I was like, oh, I wish I could kind of do this in a year after this project has happened. So um, Climate Home is a collaboration with Sounds Like Chaos, um, who are a 12 to 25 year old theatre company based at the Albany Theatre in Deptford, and they're amazing. Um, and then Build Up, who are an organisation that design and build with kids and young people, so they've got insurance for like a nine-year-old to, to use an impact driver um, and uh, I met them when I was a play worker um, and it's the Lewisham Borough of Culture this summer so they approached so yeah this is uh, these are other people we're inviting on to, into the parties we're doing a six-week um, project this summer called Climate Home and we're trying to bring in people from all across Lewisham to be part of this project which I'm finding still really hard to describe but it will hopefully become clearer as I go along it's in um, an adventure playground in um, Deptford um, and uh, we're going to use um, working with the youth worker there be there for six weeks over the summer um, it's an adventure playground and I don't know if everyone's familiar with these worlds there's a lot of them across London and they were started um, wait, what's the next slide? Yes, yeah, so top left is one of the original ones. They, they were often on bomb sites around London, so kids just started building stuff with materials that were there, so very osid. <laughs> um, and gradually lots of these spaces became valued by some parents and protected, and we're left now with lots of these spaces um, across London, but they're definitely under threat. So the one we're working with in Deptford is open for four hours a week um, which is really tough to encounter um, the young people that use that space um, so yeah for six weeks we're going to be there and when I say we it's mainly going to be Sounds Like Chaos and lots of other young people from across Lewisham, Lewisham programming that space for six weeks They're being, so most of the budget's going on paying young people to co-produce this project um, and so these are photos of last summer. So we did a mini test of it in, in the Albany Garden um, last summer for a week plus two days. Um, and I wouldn't say this is the most elegant piece of architecture, but um, I'll talk a bit through the process of how we did it. So yeah, this is Build Up, who I, who I talked about. Um, so that's at Lollard Street, where I used to work. Um, 
And uh, so to Hewan, who runs it, I just said, OK, I think we just, need, we just need a structure that could be a space where people could do some things, um, but we need to be able to build it in two days with 10 people that have never used power tools before and might be kind of anywhere between 14 and 25. And so I sent him something much more complex than this, and he sent this back. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we first decided where it might go, um, kind of doing the, the judging of bodies in space. Um, and then we started building it. And so this was partly an experiment to see, like, do you want to build something next summer? Is this something you enjoy? Um, and they did, well, not all of them, but a lot of them really enjoyed that experience of just something being done in two days. So in this case, we designed it, but we just wanted to do something efficiently that people could just build and feel that sense of achievement and gain some skills. Um, then we then started moving in and we'd managed to scavenge bits and materials and slowly we added bits to the structure, but according to event, party, according to need. Um, so we needed a notice board to put up our drawings that we were doing. So then built a notice board and shelves appeared because where do you put the pen? and Furniture just kept moving around depending on different events. Um, so yeah, this was so over that week, young people proposed workshops they wanted to do or wanted to receive. So someone, so Indabani was like, I want to do a spoken word workshop and I want to do a performance of everyone's pieces on the Friday. And Ines was like, who studies fashion, she said, I want to do do a bit where everyone brings in old clothes and we chop them up and we make them. And at the end of the day, we do a fashion show. And but also the requested expertise. So someone else was like, I want to build a sound system. And so we found someone who could help with that and came in and they made a Bluetooth speaker by the end of the week. Um, but we also invited in other people. So I invited in Sam, who developed the hempcrete sugar panels that we used on Flat House. And it felt like a real gamble to kind of I said, what's going to happen if we invite this person to talk about her work in this space? And it was such an amazing conversation. So this was the chill out zone that kind of appeared um, under a tree. And, um, and it was just kind of amazing inviting Sam into that space. And she spoke about this quite grown up thing of a cladding panel that's made of hempcrete and sugar, but they really got it. And it, it started an amazing conversation about the compromises of trying to produce materials. You know, this Cladding was partly funded by the airline industry, so we had a whole conversation about that, and she talked about the difficulties in those decisions, and it started a conversation about fast fashion, and um, it was just so unexpected, and I, and I do think that there's something about the environment that we created that's very different to mainstream education that meant that that conversation could happen in a quite different way. Um, and we also invited someone from the local council to talk about their sustainability strategy and again invited him to sit on a beanbag as a guest of these young people. And the conversation again felt very different to what I think it might have felt like in a council office or in a classroom. Um, so yeah, this was Chiquita turned 21 and wanted a 21 minute rave on the Friday. So in about an hour, we transformed the space into a party space. Um, this was the fashion show. Um, this was a tie-dyeing workshop. Uh, this was a chair-making workshop. Again, I wouldn't say the most elegant designs, but it was, again, more about the process, potentially, than the, the products. Um, and by the end, we had this kind of funny, festy encampment, but um, had a lot of fun getting there. Um, so yeah, moving to the playground um, this summer, we did our first uh, day at last half term, which was our first encounter of kind of meeting s some of the young people that might use that space um, and working with the staff there, who you know, we've been meeting with for a long time. Um, and yeah, so it's going to be an interesting summer. And I think what we're really seeing it as <coughs> these six weeks is, yes, it's about young people programming stuff, but I think it's also experiments it's like an experiment in like this is how amazing youth provision could be that's been like totally decimated um to make a case for it and also if it's youth-led this is what it could look like um but also we've got some funding to change the, these spaces so part of the strategy of the borough of culture is to take some of this funding that's coming for arts for and to to channel it into youth services which is so underfunded um, so we've got some money to improve the building, to improve some of the play structures, but we're using the summer as this whole kind of inhabited experimentation time to have the conversations, but also crucially build the relationships, because 
for places like this to be sustainable, you need lots of different organisations using them, local people using them, caring about them. And so at the moment, we're, we were like, how do we design a kitchen when no one runs it? You know, we don't have a brief for that kitchen. So the summer is also going to be about building the relationships, finding the people who might look after this space in order to kind of co-create a brief and then some designs. Um, but also want to invite in lots of different designers and architects, artists over the summer, summer so that there's a kind of diversity of approaches to, to, to design and space shaping. Um, wait, how am I doing for time? Stop. Okay, I'm going to stop. Just quickly end. This isn't my work, but this is just Doina Petrescu, who works at Sheffield. I'm just really excited to meet her because she thinks a lot about these kind of urban ecologies and does re stuff that I just kind of think is really nice. She's doing hard research into and diagrams. So, yeah, just feel very lucky to, to have met her and feels relevant to this. So, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Gosh, what an afternoon we're having. Um, Lettice, thank you very much, and sort of a window into your world, and I think uh, also showing us that there are alternative ways of architectural practice, and I hope that's inspiration uh, to some of you out there, but it should also be an inspiration to us teaching architecture that we need to recognise and see that there are alternative routes, and it's all, you know, it is all connected. Um, I think also what I take away is that, you know, yesterday we talked a lot about sustainable building materials and actually what we're learning this afternoon is it's actually about how you do it and who you do it with and how, you know, how you convey that agency um, to the people and they're buying into to making their own environments and shaping their own environments. And it's not, um, again, very hard word for architects and I saw you say it's not always about aesthetics and I think we have to accept that and not be apologetic that oh it doesn't look very good on that but um, it's that there's other meanings in places and, and that we recognize those meanings however it's time for a coffee break in the meantime um half an hour or yeah so if we could come back at half past three please then we can catch up with the program Welcome back uh, to what is our final uh, session. We have two more speakers this afternoon, and then we'll go into a discussion uh, with all the, the afternoon speakers. So if you've got any questions, keep lining them up. Um, our next speaker is joining us online, Yetagesu uh, Tekle Tegegne, um, who will be talking about Circular Bioeconomy uh, bio Alliance, Sustainable Timber for People and the Planet. Um, he's a senior researcher at the Governance Programme of the European Forest Institute and is currently working as coordinator of Circular Bioeconomy Econ Alliance. He's been working on advancing knowledge of forest governance, restoration drivers of land use changes and policy analysis, anal analysis in Africa, Asia and Latin America for the past 12 years and I'm sure another very exciting uh, presentation. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Itagesu, and uh, I work for European Forest Institute. And uh, thank you for the organizers to to give me the opportunity to talk about the Circular by Economy Alliance of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales and activities of the Alliance, and uh, specifically our experience of working with local communities as part of the global network of living labs that we are currently establishing to produce sustainable wood for planet and people while restoring biodiversity and uh, enhancing the resilience of uh, local livelihoods. I'm very delighted to do, to do so. And uh, yeah, I would um, start my talk with a bit of background of, of uh, the reason why uh, HRH, His Royal Highness, established Circular Bioeconomy Alliance and, and also give you an example uh, 
of, of how we work with the local communities and the key lessons we have gathered in terms of producing sustainable timber for, um, for, the, for the planet and, and, and the people. So, as you may know, in the last 50 years, the biosphere upon which humanity depends has been altered to unparalleled degree. Our economic model, which relies on fossil resources and is addicted to growth at all costs, is putting at risk not only life on Earth or our planet, but also the world's economy. So, a circular bioeconomy offers a conceptual framework for using renewable natural capital to holistically transform and manage our land, food, health, and industrial systems, as well as our crisis. So in, in response to these challenges, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales established the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance, CBA, in 2020, to accelerate the transition from a linear fossil resource addicted economy to a circular bioeconomy that is climate neutral, inclusive, and prospers in harmony with nature. So the Alliance CBA is action-oriented partnership that connects the dots between investors, companies, governmental and non-governmental organizations and local communities to advance the circular bioeconomy on the ground while restoring biodiversity globally. So the Alliance is facilitated by a secretariat hosted at European Forest Institute, and I'm coordinating the activities of, of the Alliance. So what do we do in practice to really achieve or contribute to our mission of accelerating the transition toward the circular bioeconomy? Uh, so there are several activities we conduct activities that can be categorized under these uh, four bullet points. The first one is raising awareness and inspiring actions towards a circular bioeconomy. For that, we organize uh, online conferences and, and workshops uh, for private actors, uh, governments, civil society, and any interested stakeholders. And second, we catalyze investment and connect investors to bring circular bioeconomy from niche to norm. And the other activity we do uh, is about demonstrating the transformative potential of landscape restoration and circular bioeconomy value chains through what we call it a global network of living labs for nature, people, and planet. And then finally, we also support uh, regional initiatives such as the African uh, Forest Landscape Restoration and 2020 uh, initiative in Latin America in terms of their effort to restore degraded land and regaining ecological um, integrity. Before I move to one of the core activities of the Alliance, the Living Labs, I would like to say a couple of sentences regarding circular bioeconomy. For us, a circular bioeconomy relies on healthy, biodiverse, and resilient ecosystem. It, is, it aims to, to provide sustainable well-being through the production of ecosystem services and the sustainable management of biological resources, plants, animals, microorganisms, and derived biomass, including organic waste and etc. So these are transformed 
in a circular manner into food, feed, energy, and, uh, and biomaterials within the ecological boundaries of, of the ecosystem that it relies on. So the circular bioeconomy, which is powered by, by renewable energy, includes and interlinks holistically a number of systems and, uh, and sectors, such as economic and industrial sectors, relying on biological resources and uh, nature-based solutions, such as food, textile, pharmaceuticals, bioenergy and extra. It also includes primary production se sectors such as agriculture, forestry, and fishery, and, and land and marine ecosystem, as well as a green infrastructure and in the services they um, provide in, uh, in cities. Um, at the moment, we are or the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance is building a global network of what we call living labs for nature, people, and planet to demonstrate how harmony can be achieved by empowering nature, people, in a concrete territorial context, integrating traditional knowledge, capitalizing on available new research and innovation and based on public private partnership that place local communities at the center so each living lab each cba living lab uses a landscape restoration project at the starting point to catalyze the development of bioeconomy value chains while restoring biodiversity and local livelihoods. So the living labs combine both landscape approach, which needs collaborative thinking and partnership, and the value chain approach to deliver long-term jobs, economic prosperity as the basis for human well-being and the restoration of natural uh, capital. So the CBA living labs, Basically, they are co-designed together with local communities and relevant stakeholders taking into account, as I indicated earlier, local culture, knowledge, tradition, as well as the new possibilities offered by research, science, technology, and innovation. So examples of activities um, considered under the Living Lab uh, include regenerative agriculture, organic farming, sustainable forestry, agroforestry, processing uh, facilities, architect, um, artisanal activities, and, uh, and so on. Um, so ancestral know-how and scientific knowledge agree on the fact that tree growing is one of the best strategies to restore and regenerate our landscape and ecosystems. To succeed, we need long-term holistic approaches and principles to ensure ecosystem integrity and the sustainable well-being of local communities. Hence, we co-develop a set of principles to guide the unless work in catalyzing regenerative landscape. So what you see in my slide here are the key principles that we ensure while establishing, implementing, and monitoring the various activities of our living lab. And, and the principles are not in any particular order of importance. So the first principle is about acknowledging biodiversity as a true engine of circular bioeconomy. This is because biodiversity determines the capacity of biological systems to adapt and evolve in a changing environment, and therefore is crucial for ensuring the resilience and sustainability of our biological resources, as well as our efforts on the ground to restore 
uh, landscapes and enhance the livelihoods of local community. So we do that in our, by selecting three species that maximize biodiversity, applying uh, natural forest restoration where possible, introducing indigenous multi-purpose tree species in farms, agroforestry, and so on and so forth. So the second principle is about focusing on sustainable business models and value chain. We co-design, co-create local adapted business models and uh, circular bioeconomy value chains, relying on biological resources and nature-based system, food, wood construction, biomaterials, biopharmaceuticals, bioenergy, and so on and so forth. So in every living lab, we ensure that there is an off-taker. It could be a, a corporate or co association or, 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 or a, a private company that could buy products and services from restored lands from our living labs. Another key important principle is about facilitating local stakeholders, including land owners, uh, land managers, communities, indigenous people, civil society, government in the private sector to collectively uh, design, decide on, govern and benefit from change, respecting local tradition and rights. For that, we co-develop, co-create a governance structure, multi-stakeholder platform uh, uh, together with local communities to ensure that um, they are at the core of our activity. And I'll come back to this, to this principle when I introduce a case study um, in Ghana. So the first principle is, is connecting the dots from finance to the landscape. Uh, connecting ambitions and sustainable solutions uh, with resources. Hence, we work with private companies, philanthropic organizations, and then etc. And other important principle is about capitalizing on traditional knowledge while uh, introducing new technology to create, co-create innovative bio-based value chains as a basis for prosperous landscape and local economy. And the last one is about restoring harmony, um, renewing harmony with uh, between humanity and, uh, and nature in, at the core of creating regenerative landscape. The search for harmony, in fact, needs to be based not only on knowledge, but also wisdom, beauty, and uh, and spirituality. Um, as we speak, uh, we have established, uh, or we have 16 living labs in, in, in four continents, restoring biodiversity, enhancing landscape resilience, while improving uh, local uh, livelihoods. And uh, in a minute, I will briefly introduce our living lab, the first living lab uh, in Ghana and how we work with local communities and indigenous people. Um, so this is, this is the first living lab for the, for the Alliance uh, that we establish in partnership with local communities uh, local government, civil society organization, and AstraZeneca, the, the pharmaceutical company, which puts, which has a logo or, or um, vision of healthy planet for healthy people. So we have, um, so we work with, with Atebobu and Wasi community in the, in the central Ghana. And, and that region is, is, is key for, for charcoal production and natural forest land has been lost uh, due to heavy encroachment and tree cutting for charcoal and timber. And, and this environmental degradation has led to a socioeconomic crisis uh, in terms of um, uh, lower level of incomes and uh, lower, level, lower quality of life and so on and so forth. So that the communities are very poor. So in response to this, 
these problems, we created a, a strong public-private community partnership to foster both ecological and community, community resilience and to demonstrate the power of biodiversity regeneration and a nature-inspired economy to improve uh, livelihoods and catalyze economic alternatives, all co-designed with, with uh, local stakeholders. So in short, the Living Lab focuses on restoration of 2,500 hectares uh, of degraded forest and establishment of woodlots on 1,000 hectares to be used to grow sustainable timber and, and, and fuel, fuel wood, which is the main source of energy in the area, and agroforestry one, on 1,500 hectares and then establishing regenerative agriculture. So the Living Lab aims to improve livelihoods for local community, particularly for women and youth, uh, through employment in three nurseries, um, in, in the timber valley chain, and as community mobilizes and then the, the income grows. So it facilitates capacity building through an, an outgrower scheme and then community meeting. So the wood from restore land and the map you see is, is the landscape where the project is being implemented. So the wood will be used for construction purpose, for fuel wood, and, and it also be used as, as input to, to uh, forest processing fa facilities to produce plywood. Um, yes, next slide. And then, um, so as, as I said, one of the key principle of, of the Circular by Economy Alliance and of, of creating regenerative landscape is actually empowering local communities and, and indigenous people. So we always put community at the center of, of our action. In fact, it is crucial that lo uh, local communities are at the heart of our action. Failing to include them is one of the most common um, causes of unsuccessful restoration, reforestation efforts globally. So not only does working with local community encourage successful long-term outcomes for a project or, or living clubs, but it also benefits the uh, community by creating employment in land preparation, tree planting, forest maintenance, and um, providing opportunity to uh, produce sustainable wood for forest-based um, enterprises. So recognizing this, for the Living Lab in Ghana, we, we co-designed a community engagement program, uh, which, all, which includes a multi-stakeholder platform, a project advisory board, a project board, and so on and so forth. So the, the, so the multi-stakeholder platform means purpose is to actually engage local communities um, to collectively design and govern and benefit from, from the, the living lab. So it is fundamental to the success of our living labs. It, it helps us to ensure local communities are at the heart of, of, of decision-making process. So establishing the multi-stakeholder platform is, is in fact a co-design process, which took several months to agree on the objectives, roles, authority, decision-making process, and, 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 and so on. And as I said, we also established the project board with a responsibility of making high-level decision uh, about the direction of the living labs. And we have a representative from the multi-stakeholder platform in, on the project board. So from our experience, we can say that not seeing community is not a box that should be ticked. Seeing a community as a way of working, as important stakeholders, and then an important part of the living lab is crucial for whatever we do. So as a colleague of mine says, good community engagement is expensive, but community engagement is always very expensive. So from our own experience, 
most local people, they want to be heard, listened to, and, and in fact, they don't expect us to solve all their problems, you know, they just wanna be heard. So this is the same, you know, wherever you are, you work in, in Europe or UK or Asia or Africa. So having the multi-stakeholder platform and saying to the community that this is how we will work and where you can raise your concerns and share thoughts can actually enhance the confidence and build trust with the local communities that could actually strengthen the success or continuity of, of, of the project. So whenever we go to the field, we usually hear feedback from the local communities saying that, ah, so what is in for you? Why are you doing this? You know, are you going to take all the crops off from us and then so on? So, so we need to be really, you know, hundred percent transparent with them. And it is about building those relationships. So being open, accessible, rather than not being, you know, uh, accessible. Uh, that is really crucial, you know, saying them, here is my phone number, uh, give, a, give us a ring, uh, uh, talk with us about your, your, your concerns and doubts about the project. And, and as I said earlier, they don't really uh, want to have answers to everything, but they do want some kind of being able to respond to, to the staff rather than not, not listening. Of course, you get, you know, some awkward people here and there, but if you get the kind of mechanisms where people can come and talk and you listen and communicate, then you can walk long distance and positively impact the landscape and local livelihoods of the local community. So let me finish my intervention, my talk by saying there is no option, but to work with, with communities, with local communities and indigenous people whose livelihood depends on, on the land, not only to produce timber and, and, and ecosystem services for a number of reasons, but for any activities and action we do on the ground. So we cannot do without them. So there is no other way but engage community and create shared values. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for joining us from Brussels this afternoon and for your insights um, into this amazing project. Projects, if you think of all that, I believe there's 16 um, living labs. Um, I think most importantly, you almost repeat what Catriona and Lettuce are doing, but on a completely different scale, you know, but the principles are the same, the values are the same, the importance of people's li livelihoods, the importance of engagement, um, of co-design. So I think, you know, this is also something to reflect on as, as how we work at very different scales, the scale of nature, the scale of individual buildings, and yet they are all connected and at the base of it all is people and communities to which they matter matter most. Which brings me to our final uh, speaker before we uh, continue uh, to our discussion. So keep lining up those questions. Um, and I'm very pleased to announce my colleague, Professor Michael, um, uh, Marcel Villinger. I get the uh, <laughs> Marcel's a researcher and teacher at Oxford Brookes University and specializes in the anthropology of architecture, vernacular architecture, rural architectural regeneration, tradition, culture, and sustainability, and ethnographic research methods. He's the research lead of the school and director of the Place Culture and Identity Research Group. He's also director of the Endangered Wooden Architecture Program, and significantly for today, the editor of the Encyclopedia of Vernacular Architecture of the World, uh, which he's going to talk about. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Harriet, really, and, and Inbao for inviting me to speak today about this Encyclopedia of Vernacular Architecture of the World, 
um, which has been going on for way too long, to be honest, but hopefully will be finished by next year. Um, I just realized this is probably, the, well, it is the first time that I'm speaking to a face-to-face -face audience again in more than two years, so that's, that's really nice. Surely one of the negatives um, has been of, of the whole COVID situation has been able not to do that. Um, and on a personal note, one of the other negatives is that I now need to use glasses because I've been staring at the computer screen for so long. So um, I apologize for that. Um, okay, so in recent months, um, I've been reading some books on a variety of topics, as I'm sure we all do, um, that all seem to share one aim, to convince the reader that there, is, that there are lessons to be learned from the past um, and from other places. Now, most explicit in this objective is no doubt uh, Jared Diamond's The World Until Yesterday, What Can We Learn from Traditional Societies, which some of you may know. Um, but there are many others, including New Oliver's Wisdom of the Ancients, Life Lessons from Our Ancient Past, which was published in 2020. While Oliver looks to the past for lessons, um, rather than to the ethnographic present, as Diamond does, both are adamant um, that there is something to be learned here. Now, learning from tradition in the past is in vogue, I think, um, and that this is so should not come as a surprise, um, as it reflects the fact that we are living in a time of precarity and uncertainty, ecologically, politically, economically, and for increasing numbers of us, um, also emotionally and psychologically. The confidence in development, modernity, progress, um, that characterized much of the second half of the 20th century has slowly but consistently eroded during the last few decades as a result of a series of economic, political, ecological, and of course most recently global health crises. A growing unease and awareness of the potentially devastating results of the choices that have been made to pave the way for our modern global way of life um, has gradually replaced faith. As the um, Norwegian anthropologist um, Ericsson has said, the world is um, overheated. Now, as history has taught us, at a time when a sense of stability, security, and confidence in the future is hard to find, uh, the tendency to look to the past is a common, though not inevitable, response. In our desire to move forward in a different way, we look back to see what, whether what, um, we look back to see what we no longer need and what we can take with us, even if those are things that we had already discarded and forgotten about, and that thus may have to be revived or reimagined. To an extent, such looking back makes sense, as history does indeed hold examples and clues as to how to do things in an alternative manner. It also comes with a number of warning bells, however, as that same history also teaches us that the golden age of the past uh, was, never as, was never as golden as we think, and the circumstances in which we live now have changed from then, and will continue to do so as history unfolds so that tried and tested traditions from the past do not necessarily work in the present, let alone in the future. In this context, it is not surprising that learning lessons from vernacular architecture has also become a popular theme in the last 20 years or so. Architecture as a discipline and a profession is heavily implicated in some of the challenges that the 21st century poses, as I'm sure we all know, um, including climate change, and, related to that, the creation and reproduction of social, economic, and political inequalities. An interest in vernacular architecture commonly comes about in response to some sort of dissatisfaction with contemporary architectural practice. So this is kind of something that we see um, throughout the 20th century. Vernacular architecture, I would argue, is the architecture of the other, with a capital O. So the common people, the non-architects, the regional, the everyday. And as such, it is perfectly positioned to teach us lessons. What, however, are these lessons to be learned? There are undoubtedly many, uh, and I'm sure many of these have been um, discussed already at this Congress, and I've, 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 I've seen some um, very persuasive ones just this afternoon. Um, but I would here like to emphasize four, four lessons that I think underpin the work that we have been doing uh, in recent years at Oxford Brookes University. Um, now, paradoxically, perhaps, the first lesson that the study of vernacular architecture teaches us is that vernacular architecture does not exist. 
Vernacular architecture is the architecture of the other, as I said, with a capital O, a concept that has been called into existence to help define and validate the architectural canon. While the concept has been useful to help identify, define, and represent a truly enormous range of architectural traditions that have conventionally fallen outside this architectural canon, in identifying and emphasizing their otherness, which we continue to do, it has not actually increased our understanding of the meaning of the architecture concerned. Related to this, the second lesson is that architect architectural traditions are dynamic, ever-changing creative processes through which people as active agents, and we've seen examples of this today, uh, negotiate, interpret, and adapt knowledge and experiences gained in the past within the context of the challenges, wishes, and requirements of the present. Tradition is not a bounded, depersonalized, and unchanging body of knowledge, customs, or values that is simply handed down from generation to generation, ready to be used. But it is a process that requires the active involvement of people who will need to actively discover, learn, apply, and adapt its contents in a process of continuous becoming. Thirdly, the third lesson, um, as traditions are dynamic, the architecture that embodies them is never static, but always changing as well and in a continuous state of becoming, just as much as the people who design, make and dwell in, at, on or about it, and the environment that encompasses both. Architecture is not fixed, but processual and relational, like the materials it is made of and the people that create and inhabit it. As part of this continuous process of becoming, architectural traditions appear merge, amalgamate, change, move, and disappear as human values, beliefs, habits, and customs alter, and the environment that encompasses it all changes in itself in a continuous process of becoming. Finally, I think, the fourth lesson. The result of all these changes in environment, culture, knowledge, and tradition is the huge diversity of, of, of ways of designing making and dwelling, and I define dwelling here in the sense of um, Paul Oliver as uh, the processes of living in or at or on or about a place. So it's this, it's this huge diversity of ways of designing, making and dwelling that have made up and continue to make up the world's architecture. It is this diversity which is in itself ever-changing and the way in which it is a repository of different ontologies and worldviews of different ways of engaging with the natural environment and with one another, um, of different ways of inhabiting space, of building and of giving meaning. Um, it is the way in which it is this repository that provides the real lesson, I think, of vernacular architecture. That there is no one form of architecture that is necessarily better, more interesting, more appropriate, more advanced, more traditional, or indeed, dare I say it, more sustainable than any other. Now, it was to capture this richness, di diversity, and ingenuity of the world's architectural traditions that had conventionally been left out of the architectural canon that led Paul Oliver to begin his Encyclopedia of Vernacular Architecture of the World um, back in the late 1980s, and it was published in 1997. When we started work on the second edition in 2015, so uh, a long time ago actually, um, the same objective still guided us. However, an added aim was to make sure that the new edition reflects the lessons I just outlined and captures vernacular architecture not as bounded, location-specific and unchanging form of architectural heritage, but as, a dynamic, but as dynamic traditions of designing, making and dwelling that develop in tandem with the ever-changing environments that they form part of. Now, I'm sure you realize that it is quite paradoxical to edit an encyclopedia of vernacular architecture of the world um, while arguing that there is no such thing as vernacular architecture. Um, but the awareness that the traditions that we now include in the second edition would never end up in a conventional encyclopedia or handbook of architecture mean that I can still 
see the value of the second edition of the encyclopedia. As one of the pioneers of vernacular architecture studies, Professor Henry Glassie once wrote, to give it the vernacular, to give it a name, is to give it an existence. So publishing the second edition means that the traditions concerned are acknowledged, at least, described and defined, uh, and hopefully valued. Now, in the 25 years, uh, yeah, 25 years since the publication of the first edition back in 1997, considerable amount of new research has, of course, taken place around the world and by scholars from various disciplinary backgrounds. And I would like to think that actually the first edition uh, kind of contributed to that increased um, amount of research, both in terms of the documentation of the vernacular architecture of specific cultures, or peoples, or places, um, but also in terms of theoretical approaches towards the definition, documentation, analysis, development, and representation of vernacular architecture more generally. The aim of the second edition is to capture this new research and to make it available, both in print and online, to as wide an audience um, as possible. So it's, it's, it's being published by Bloomsbury Publishing um, and should appear in, in both in print, or will appear in both in print and uh, as an online, online resource. Now the work on the second edition uh, has been a little bit more laborious than I initially thought. Um, or hoped, um, and it has been pretty dynamic, I suppose, and the deadline has been moving forward and forward and forward. Um, and it has inevitably, of course, been delayed uh, for various reasons and among other things, uh, that is the, the pandemic. At the moment, and I emphasize at the moment, the expected publication date is 2023, and probably the end of that year. Um, it will comprise six volumes, and around 2,700 entries, uh, bringing together the work of some 1,150 authors. The vast majority of existing cultural entries, so the ones that already existed in the first edition, will have been updated to reflect our current knowledge of the people and architecture concerned. Many new cultures have been added, or new traditions, I should say, have, have, have been added, expanding the geographic and cultural coverage of the first edition. All entries on theories, approaches, concepts and methods have been revised or rewritten to reflect current theoretical discourses and understanding. With the proviso that when I say current, um, some of them have been written a few years ago, so obviously it's a kind of thing that we have to try and keep um, updating in the online version. Two, new, two completely new sections on consumption and sustainability have been added to capture the impact of population growth, urbanization, globalization, climate change, migration, natural disasters, conflicts, and the internationalization of architectural practice on vernacular traditions, and to cover the many attempts around the world to conserve, safeguard, or revive existing traditions, or to invent new ones, and to explore their application and appropriation in contemporary architectural practice. Now, what I think the second edition shows is that the richness, diversity, and ingenuity of the world's architectural traditions is still there, um, even if it no longer takes the same form as it did 25 years ago. The many entries um, show that in all parts of the world, vernacular architecture has been subject to change, as one would expect. In broad terms, these changes can be classified as material, um, technological, economic, sociopolitical, spatial, and symbolic. All these types of transformation are mutually connected um, and indeed entangled and are interdependent, resulting in some parts of the world in vernacular landscapes and forms of architecture that are radically different from what they were even 25 years ago. Some vernacular forms that feature in the first edition have disappeared altogether um, for various reasons, neglect, just simply abandonment or, or environmental change or, uh, or, or sadly in many uh, cases because of conflict. Um, and many sadly are very close, I think, to disappearing soon. In other, in other instances, change has been much more gradual and less obvious, um, even though it may not necessarily be less significant. 
In yet others, however, previously neglected traditions have been revived and revalued. Now, these changes obviously have not always been desirable, an improvement, or indeed accepted. Um, like many scholars of vernacular architecture, and I'm sure uh, many people in this room, I'm often saddened to read about the transformations that have taken place. In some instances, the introduction of new materials or technologies has had hugely disruptive impacts on customary economic structures, on social hierarchies, on local resource management systems, or on the environmental performance of buildings. In others, it has led to local unrest or local conflict, or to the, the, or to the abandonment or even destruction um, of all the forms of building. Elsewhere, however, the introduction of the same materials or technologies may have provided new op economic opportunities, improved sanitary conditions, allowed for upward social mobility, and reinvigorated declining traditions. Now, it's important to recognize, I think, that the changes, be they material, technological, spatial, or symbolic, have not always been for the worse, and do not necessarily lead to the end of architectural traditions. Instead, as mentioned before, they are an intricate part of all architecture and allow the traditions concerned to adapt to changing environmental, cultural, economic, and political contexts. As such, they enable the traditions to endure. The result is a complex, dynamic, fluid, unpredictable, and sometimes daunting, I think, diversity of architectural settings in which the local, the national, and the global may interlink in very unexpected ways, um, and the past, present, and future may combine in an equally surprising manner. And, and we've seen, actually, we've seen some good examples of that. Now, it is this contemporary 21st century diversity that I hope uh, the second edition will capture. And I'm pleased to say that I think, to a significant extent, it actually does. Um, it should also be noted, however, that the second edition has exposed major gaps in our knowledge and our understanding of the world's vernacular heritage. While we know a lot about some places, Europe, say, or North America, uh, or, 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 or in fact places in the Global South, Indonesia, other places, large parts of Africa, quite significant parts of Latin America, and almost the entirety of the former Soviet Union, um, and even China, are very underrepresented, simply because the scholarship is hard to find. Um, another observation is that at the same time, many of us working in this field of vernacular architecture, or indeed architecture more generally, still hold on to rather romanticized notions of an authentic vernacular that is pre-modern and that ignore um, current day realities, resulting in stereotypical and static representations that do not do justice to the architecture or to its designers, its makers, its owners or its inhabitants, all of whom live now in the 21st century just like us and not in some fictitious ethnographic present. The diversity, richness and ingenuity that inspired Paul Oliver back in the late 1980s to start work on the first edition and that no doubt inspired many of us, um, including myself, to study vernacular architecture is still there. The second edition, I hope, will reflect this reality. The traditional vernacular buildings are still there, while new ones are emerging alongside them all the time. The know-how and wisdom that is embodied in the traditional architecture is in many cases still there too, even if it is often rapidly transforming and in some cases disappearing, being replaced or amalgamated with forms of engagement with materials, spaces, and technologies that represent a new vernacular. It is part of our task, I believe, as scholars of vernacular architecture, and in fact of scholars of architecture, with whatever prefix we want to kind of, um, you know, prefix it, um, I think it's our task to capture this traditional know-how and the ways of life that embody them, and to safeguard it for future generations. Um, and, and the Endangered Wooden Architecture Program that Eileen referred to um, tries to do just that. Um, 
Just as much, though, as it is our task to recognize and study the new forms of know-how and the new ways of life that are appearing and that in many cases creatively combine with the old vernacular ones. To do so, we should not see vernacular traditions as bounded, as depersonalized um, and unchanging bodies of knowledge, customs, values, or actual architectural forms that we can just quite conveniently document, describe, and, and pass down or, or, or take aspects from. Um, but we should see them as dynamic, ever-changing processes of knowing, designing, making, and dwelling that are essentially similar to their more modern or contemporary counterparts, whether we like it or not. Um, and that if we engage with them critically and creatively and in combination with the latter more modern versions, if you like, um, may help us collectively to face the manifold challenges facing us today. Thank you. very much. You, you're not aware of this, but you, there was a long debate yesterday on terminology and right. what all these things mean, so I think this will probably open up a lot of questions that, that follow up from that. So I think that's a great way of concluding um, the two days of coming back to, to some of the discussions from yesterday morning, too. Can I invite this, the afternoon speakers, please? Great. Well, um, Thank you all very much for a, a very dynamic uh, final session um, to the event. And I think um, at the coffee break, everyone was sort of discussing it and talking about it and, and had lots of um, questions. Uh, before we go to the floor, if I'll, I'll take um, my moderator's privilege of, of sort of setting the, the first question. And it is mainly to the first three speakers, but um, you're all welcome to answer. You talked, all three of you talked very much about sort of individual and single solutions, sort of finding solutions at the very sort of coal face and regarding each building, each community, um, each space, place, and so on. Whereas yesterday, when we're talking about materials, there was a big sort of push becoming much more obvious now with things like hemp or hempcrete and, and earth of sort of scaling up, sort of moving things up to sort of making it more um, available uh, and say taking it um, to sort of more mass production for example how do you see that relationship between that importance of individual solutions and place space solutions and the and scaling up the lessons learned um, from that and if you could sort of reflect on that um, anyway can you use the microphone please um, just because we're um, um, yeah, I, I think that by giving the skills and the knowledge about materials and techniques that aren't necessarily from that place but have, um, um, have relevance to, to building there, if you give that knowledge to um, local people and allow them to decide how to use it in a way that's appropriate for their context. I think that's a good way of doing that. So for example, in Sierra Leone, there's sort of um, two, two types of um, vernacular they, that they use earth for. One is they make adobe blocks, and the other is that they use a kind of wattle and daub. Um, and one thing that I've been trying to do there is introduce um, rammed earth. So they're used to using earth, um, and they've got really good quality earth there, but using it as um, um, to sort of create more, I guess, monolithic looking structures mm -hmm. is not something that they've, they've done. And to me, that, that seemed like um, a good sort of midpoint between wanting to, them wanting to always build in concrete and build these sort of modern looking mm -hmm. things and using a material that's there that's um, relatively inexpensive, that they already have experience of using, that's good quality, that makes total thermal sense. Um, so I think, um, I think you can combine the two. I think you can take the sort of global knowledge mm -hmm. and um, I think if you can give local people who understand the context
text mm. better than anyone else that knowledge then I think you you get a really good happy medium we just go, let us do you want to? Um, I'm trying to figure out if this answers the question, but I think, um, I don't know, so I've, I've found myself drawn to really small projects where I can have quite close relationships with people involved, so it sometimes feels like their impact can't be that much, but I think there's a reason that the afternoon was called case studies, and it's that if you kind of go for it on, on one example, you can... That, that elements of it can become a model, but there can also be humility about it and lessons that can be learned, things that could be done better. And um, so strand that we're doing alongside this project is we're getting some GLA funding to do um, youth-led research into adventure playgrounds across mm -hmm. London and the models that are working, the places that are surviving and why they're surviving and what the kind of economies and ecologies of those spaces are um, alongside looking at mental health. But you know, for us, there's lots of very individual, specific examples across London and beyond, mm -hmm. and historic ones as well that kind of aren't a wholesale approach, but there are many, you know, they're plural and we can learn from them all and, and you know, we might be part of that lineage um, as well. No, I think I agree, I agree with, with all of that. Um, to me, scaling up is a really difficult term because there's a, there's a sense of almost imposition there. Um, and yeah, the, the idea of local um, specific solutions to specific problems I think is important. Maybe it's scaling out rather than scaling up, but scaling up to me somehow feels a tiny bit kind of aggressive and impositional almost. It's about sharing of experience and examples and approaches. And so, yeah, it's that I'd like to get more of a collaborative sense with individual sites and conditions into whatever we call it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, yeah, actually, if, that, if that's okay, just because it's interesting thinking about what Paloma's doing. So her kind of mission is to affect the mainstream construction industry with low embodied carbon materials to find more sustainable ways of, of, of building a lot of housing. Um, and. Um, so conversations that we have, are, you know, are about scaling up, but it's, you know, because I'm, I'm an architect who likes to have a nice time on a building site, but um, I think a really important conversation is the, the culture in the construction industry, the culture in the architectural industry, and the lack of conversation between those in kind of Eurocentric North, Northern American cultures. Um, and it's really, it's really problematic that there's not enough... Um, collaboration between those mm -hmm. things. Builders aren't invited onto the design team as consultants and it's to the detriment of the design and those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the kind of something that could be looked at on scale a bit better, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, you take us with us um, from uh, online. Um, and I mean, you're on a very different scale in the fact that you're working on very big um, uh, scales but also the fact that you've got 16 uh, living labs. Um, I think, you know, how do you sort of transfer knowledge and understanding from one to the other, yet also keep them sort of place uh, grounded um, as such? So maybe we can learn from your experience as well on this. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, the, the Alliance is really young. Huh? It was established in 2020, so it's only two years old, basically. Uh, but one aspect of your question with regard to uh, placing, you know, grounded and then and, and having a, a local adapted solutions is, 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 is an important element for us, and that's why we always co-design every solutions together with local communities and, and relevant stakeholders, even identifying the problems. We don't go there and say that this is degraded land, hence we need to restore. I can tell you my own personal experience. I'm originally from Ethiopia and I was born and grown up in the south central part of Ethiopia along the Rift Valley. I think around the age of 12, 13, I used to take cattle and then cows and sheep to graze. A um, couple of international NGOs came to our village and said that, ah, okay, this is degraded and we would like to restore it. And they put the fence 
all the way, you know, kilometers and kilometers of fence. And for them, that land is degraded land. But for us, it's an important source of fodder and, and, um, and um, fuel load, you know, but the project didn't stay. So my point there is that we need to co-design. It has to be collaborative effort for collaborative impact in our working together with the local communities and, 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 and indigenous people whose livelihood depends on that. So that is how we think, and that is how our approach in terms of identifying um, adapted solutions, locally adapted specific solutions to specific uh, uh, problems. And we just started transferring knowledge from one living lab to the other living labs across the uh, four continents. But that is like in terms of exchange of information, idea, experience, and so on. So the first gathering we had was in, uh, in Dumfries House, close to Glasgow, uh, late January, where we invited all project partners from all those countries and we put them in a room. Okay, so let's share what has been the challenge, what have been the lessons, what has worked in, in Nigeria in terms of addressing livelihood poverty related issues compared to Ghana, what are the similarities? And at the end of the day, one of the key lessons we learned there is that the main challenge across these different countries is more or less the same. It's about economy, it's about poverty, it's about you know, a, a lack of resources and opportunity, basically. So, so yeah, we just started transferring knowledge and creating a platform to do so, and we'll continue working on that. Um, I think let's hear some questions from the floor. Thank you. So these are um, from our online audience. Excellent. Um, we have one from Intmar Canada, um, and it's directly for Marcel. So uh, I apologize in advance for my pigeon French here, but he uh, understands the positioning of the other, but was wondering um, if he detects uh, some of the philosophy of Jal Delios, um, who he says uh, looks at showing the way that minor practices inflect and change the standard language, um, looking specifically at the encyclopedia. So quite a specific one there, but is your ref reference to the other in terms of um, well, posi positioning of the other, as you sort of expressed, uh, at all a reference to that philosopher or philosophy? Um, whether, whether there's a reference to the architecture of the other in the encyclopedia? Yes. Uh, yes, I think there is, yeah. I yeah. mean, I think it's, you know, it's been the last 10 years, if not more, I think, thinking and, and writing about, about, about this issue, really. And um, I think it relates to what we were talking about earlier as well. One of the things that I noticed from my kind of armchair anthropology kind of academic um, perspective is this continuous kind of setting up of dichotomies local global western non-western architecture building whatever you architect non-architect um, and and obviously we do that not just in the context of architecture we do that in everything that we do Ma male female old young etc etc uh, black white um, and i think one of the interesting things that we see is is that in many of these situations, be it race, be it gender, be it architecture, be it globalization, is that in reality, you know, it is a much more kind of fluid, um, uh, what's the word, trajectory really, that we, that we find ourselves on, right? So you could say this is male, this is female, but in reality we know it's not that simple. It's the same with, it's the same with race, it's the same with architecture, it's the same with local and global, it's the same with knowledge. So I heard a lot about indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, modern knowledge or Western knowledge or however we want to kind of oppose it with. Um, what, what really is the difference? You know, knowledge is, is knowledge in whatever form it takes. A lot of our Western modern knowledge is traditional, passed on in oral ways, the same ways that we think indigenous knowledge is being tra uh, transmitted, etc., etc. So I'm thinking that setting up all these dichotomies is not really helpful and the, and the Vernacular, I think, is some sort of a person, well, some sort of an embodiment of that, right? It's, it's, it's everything that architecture supposedly is not. So vernacular is local, it's natural, it's human scale, it's intimate, it's whatever. And, 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 and our architecture supposedly uh, is not. So yeah, I think that definitely in the theoretical um, entries in the encyclopedia that, that is being addressed because 
I think this is something that is recognized more and more, that that is a problem because it holds us back. The kind of examples that I saw here this afternoon are perfect examples of forms of architecture where people from different places collaborate but work in a specific context. It's always going to be local, you know. The material may come from the other side of the world. The way in which it kind of finally materializes in a, in a project is always going to be local. And there will be outsiders involved, there will be locals involved. Who is local anyway? I mean, this is not a debate, right? What makes you local? What makes you indigenous? I think these are great examples of how traditions just simply endure and are being passed on simply because they are being reinvented, revived, kind of changed, adapted um, over time. I'm not sure at all that this answers the question, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it is being addressed in the encyclopedia. Thank you. Um, Could I just pick up a question up from Robert and then we'll come back to online sure. if yeah. that's... I, I presume you're going to follow um, Robert. Sure. I thought, is your question following that one? No, okay, right. Okay. Um, in which case, have we got any more from online? Should we take one more from online? Um, so I think this is for Marcel again. It says that you pointed out that tradition is not unchanging, and, but dynamic is key. Um, but today, tradition is too often considered as a visual style in opposition to so-called contemporary styles. In what ways might we change this perception of tradition from style to process? And then it says that the encyclopedia is a great resource, but architectural education and practices operate with the assumption that the most important thing about architecture is what it looked like, rather than how it came to be, and might relinking the acts of design and building help? Right, okay, so two questions, right? So how, I think, how, how might we change the perception of tradition as this static package that we can simply pass down? I think the only way to change it is to actually seriously and critically think about what we mean by tradition and obviously Inbau has been doing that for a long time and there are other kind of academic organizations that have been doing that as well so serious you know we won't learn anything we won't change our understanding of anything if we, if we don't seriously engage with it and try to understand it in a critical manner so I think that's the only way we can do it that's why we include it in it at Oxford Brooks in, in, in how, how we teach architecture um, the second question was sorry it was um, architectural education and practice operates with the assumption that the most important thing about architecture is what it looks like rather than how it came to be. So might relinking the acts of design and building help? I don't want to be difficult, but again, I think this is, this is one of these example instances where we just assume too easily that certain things are done in a way and they're different from us. So I don't think all architectural education teaches that it's just about what a building looks like. I think that kind of is a bit downgrading on architectural education. Like, like vernacular architecture, it's diverse. There are very good schools of architecture all around the world that don't just focus on that. I think the examples that we've seen from Sheffield today or from other schools show you that architecture is not always about that. To change that would again mean, you know, asking architectural educators, educated to seriously engage with the world's problems, with the kind of local context that they find themselves in, think critically about what architecture is and what it does, and to try and hand that down, um, or, you know, communicate about that with, with their students, I think. So I think, I, I, I don't think I quite subscribe to the view that in architecture schools it's all just about form and the way it looks, because definitely in our school um, it is not. Great. Um, shall we move to the floor and then if we've still got any online, we'll, we'll pick that up. Um, Robert, did you? Okay. Yes, it's coming. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sorry, uh, th as, as it's coming to the end of two very interesting days, I'm going to ask a really simple question. Uh, it'll probably let you off, actually, Marcel, because you've spoken quite <laughs> enough already. And uh, it's really simple. The, the, the INBAO is International Network for Traditional Building Architecture and Urbanism, and of course, it is his job to advance those things. Um, and um, I'd be very interested to hear from uh, all of you, except you, Marcel, you probably all answered it already, um, is that um, how um, you feel that what you've been discussing and presenting is advancing traditional building architecture and urbanism. And just to make the answer a bit easier, um, I will say that my view of tradition in this context is both technical, in other words, passing down technical information, 
but it's also um, to do with social and cultural identity. So um, that makes the answer a bit easier. But I think you, you don't have to answer this one, so you've spent quite enough. Um, but I, I'm very interested to hear what the others have to say on this. Wow, I'll have a go um, in terms of the project. So I'm just going to think about it in terms of this project that I'm working on um, now in Lewisham. And um, I don't know if it's continuing a tradition of architecture, but it's continuing a tradition of something <laughs> that I think is quite important, which is, um, I don't know, youth work, play work, adventure play, den making, I don't know, place making, building communities together through having shared spaces and... Um, I don't know, create, valuing, valuing those spaces and um, the kind of potential for communities to co-create events and spaces together, um, which is something that's become quite challenging to do, I think. And um, I've gained so much from uh, looking back at the history of adventure play um, and speaking to people who were around um, in like the 70s when there was money for these things and what that was like. And... Um, so I guess, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm a kind of uh, looking to those traditions, um, I'd say, and that there are built elements to those. Um, so yeah, like within adventure play, uh, like I say, den making, yeah, skills of learning, building, um, and having conversations alongside that. Um, I don't know if that can be called architecture. I don't really, I don't know if it matters that much. <laughs> um, yeah. Let, let me try next. <laughs> um, I mean, I think from, a la from, from Landmark's point of view and what our portfolio does, if you like, it's all about getting people who are not necessarily used to thinking about architecture coming and experiencing places and thinking about them and thinking about why they are as they are. I mean, a big part of what we do is communicating about the history of the place how it was built, why it was built, what we have done to it as historic conservationists. Um, and as I think I mentioned, you know, we have buildings of every kind. We have ruined slate miners, uh, or not ruined now, but formerly ruined slate miners cottages in North Wales that represent a vanished way of life there that are unequivocally v vernacular. Um, we also have the politest designed architecture, if you like. And I, I just chip in one more contribution to the vernacular debate. Um, I'm coming to this as a historian, as someone who thinks a lot about historically vernacular buildings. I'm really intrigued by the concept that vernacular architecture is the other. When I'm um, trying to explain to, uh, you know, lay audiences, if you like, our supporters and so on, what is vernacular architecture? My definition is much more to do with it's everything that's not architecturally designed. Um, it's local materials, it's evolution, um, it's kind of tradition, but it's more about adaptation and so on. So that, I think, is a really important topic for, for, for everybody, whether they are architecturally trained or not, to think about and reflect upon. And in terms of how we take the traditional built environment further, unless we can persuade everyone in a multicultural society that the buildings that have created a society are important and to understand why they're still there and why they're resilient, we will never take forward um, a, a traditional architectural context. You've, you've kind of basically just said what, <laughs> similar to what I was going to say, which is that I think um, the view of traditional architecture is quite often, um, particularly in contexts like Sierra Leone, um, a, s a sort of type that you could almost just sketch in a few lines, like that's, that's the traditional architecture. And I think... Um, I think what I've been trying to do with with the builders there is to to take those those types and ask why they are like they they are, um, what what makes them work? Why why has did it evolve to a point where this was the model that was kind of copied and copied and copied? And yes, small evolutions have happened within that, but essentially you go all over Sierra Leone and you see very, very similar typologies. But why is it like that? You know, you're, you're not being asked to replicate that in the way that it looks, but 
what there, there are sort of it's really fascinating when you start peeling back the layers of these buildings the details that people have gone to and at some point generations ago people knew why they were doing that and now they don't um, and I think going back to why people decided to do things that way and why they've continued to have been done that way for so long is is really essential in taking it forward because you can take those elements and those deeper understandings and then you can can use those as tools to to um, design better and build better now for, for the current situations. Great. I, say one thing? <laughs> <laughs> I, ju I just wanted to quote Paul Oliver who said there is no such thing as traditional architecture, only architecture that embodies traditions. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. okay. Sorry, he doesn't see me looking up. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> you take it. Do you have something to add there? No, I don't have. Sorry. <laughs> right, um, from the floor, did you have a question? Yes, well, uh, here first. Sorry. Gentle um, I'm very interested to see the encyclopedia because. Uh, Perhaps it's something other, as you say, or unexpected inside than the, what it says on the cover. Um, from um, my point of view, obviously vernacular architecture has to do with material, with uh, the, the genius of the local, um, as opposed to the wisdom of the international. Uh, now, in the age of industrial production and proliferation of industrial materials, at what point um, using internationally carbon intensive uh, produced materials uh, no longer become vernacular. Uh, w you know, when, when you start building it, at, which is the point of departure? Because then vernacular becomes just like an eclectic klepto <laughs> title for, for putting everything, you know, from a migrant built returning from Germany as an uh, idea of what what uh, what uh, what the house should be like then then you know next to a thatched cottage well this is exactly the reason why I say there is no such thing as vernacular architecture because once you start to think about it why do a book about it Sorry? <laughs> well yeah okay <laughs> so we talk about it as I said in the in the talk is because if we don't talk about it if we don't give it a name like like Henry Glessy used to say it's, it's, it's invisible, right? So just by having given it a name back in the 60s or 70s and calling it vernacular architecture, it gained kind of, it, it became visual. People realized, oh, there's that stuff. It still meant that most architects said, oh, that's vernacular architecture, has nothing to do with me. Um, but at least we now talk about it. And that's the reason why I agreed to do the second edition, um, because otherwise these, these building traditions would not hardly be represented anywhere at all. But I don't think it exists in the sense of it's local or it's kind of historical or traditional or everyday or common people or non-architect design because my, my belief, I suppose, or my idea is that actually all architecture is in one way or the other everyday or local or traditional or modern or new. So it's... it's, it's, it's it's a, it's a name, right? It's just a name that's been made up to kind of give something an existence. But it doesn't exist, I think. Okay. Um, I, sorry, we're getting quite limited time. My question is sort of building on this theme in a way. I, I, I subscribe to a French construction newsletter and this week um, there was a highlighted um, building it said a, a barn a Norman barn restored with local materials and when you read the article they meant materials from within 150 kilometers so you know we always talk of local tradition how local is local um, for example uh, a, a, a house which I often show in a lecture claimed as the, the best traditional house left in Malaysia it was built in the 1930s and uh, and has a, a villa plan from you know from Venice, probably, frankly, um, you know, but how local is local, and how local are local materials? Several of you can, I mean, you all deal with, in, and I think your projects look at local materials, and um. I think local is as um, far away as the 
people who use the building. Um, and as far, as far as materials go, as far away as it makes sense to, to bring them, because there are advantages and disadvantages to mm -hmm. different materials, and you sort of weigh up the transport versus the, you know, in all sorts of kind of criteria. Um, so, yeah, I think it's what's sensible, what's sustainable. Um, and uh, I think if you wanted to define local, yeah, possibly is how far is the furthest user from that building. Anyone want to add to that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you used uh, the word you used, sensible, and I think you know, that's really critical to a lot of what we've been discussing. You know, not everything can be fully defined, you know, when we talk about food miles or when we talk about, you know, 100 kilometers, this, you know, these sort of seeking these very exact um, terminologies is not always that helpful and sometimes just having some common sense and, you know, we try and teach that in architecture, don't we? Always like, we don't have some common sense, do, you know, work it out yourself and so on. So I think that um, is worth, I think we have a question here, do we? Sorry. Well, I don't know that this contributes greatly, <laughs> um, but I was just going to say perhaps it's regional. I mean, thinking about vernacular versus designed architecture in my simplistic discrimination, you know, within a given country, um, i.e. Great Britain for me, um, apologies, <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's about the, it's about the, the materials used in an evolved way in contrast to the, the structure built to an external architect who has come in to create something that is according to fashion. And in that instance, the materials are going to be brought from outside. So maybe, maybe regional helps, I don't know. <laughs> okay, um, question there. Um, Thank you very much. Then I think we need, to, I've got one more there, and then I think we need to wrap up as time is ticking. Go on. <laughs> Sorry, I was just, I was just going to add one thing. It is just totally um, site specific. I did some work in Papua New Guinea, and they have, um, because of because of the um, terrain, they they have very distinct um, types of traditional architecture um, within each each valley and dif distinct languages and all these things. And you would say, well, that's not very far at all. But if you went over the other side of a mountain, then that would seem not to be local in that situation. Whereas there are others where you can go, you know, huge distances and you'll find exactly the same materials and exactly the same things going on. Okay. Um, um, I think we'll take both questions and then ask to answer uh, that we get the responses once we've heard the questions. So go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much. I think this conversation is being very inspiring, uh, but I wanted to take from a question that was made online and, and the idea of uh, aesthetics. And I'm glad to hear that maybe not in all schools, uh, architecture is taught uh, around the forms and around the aesthetics, but unfortunately that was my case. So the idea of the process of how things come up to be physically is never being it's never been put in discussion, which, which are the social considerations, the environmental, the economical ones. And I was lucky that then I had time to look for the readings, to look for the schools and for those places where I could uh, hear about uh, the process of how things are built instead of just aesthetically. But uh, th that's how I think it's been very complicated in my case to um, let's say, resettle my, my own idea of aesthetics, mostly when you go to Global South and your idea, my idea of beauty relates to the local material, to the raw material, to the color of the material itself, and how local communities uh, see it in a very different way. So I have kind of one question for each in, in this concern, because uh, I really like when, when you let it say that uh, you look at the process rather than at the result, but I think that's really unsettling, mostly when coming from an educational background that, that brings you to the final solution that is what everyone has to like and what everyone has to see. So I would like to know how do you deal also with that when you have to say, yeah, look, this is not maybe very nice, but what is interesting is the process, no? Mm -hmm. So I would like to know how, how you deal with that. And uh, as well, I wanted to ask you about the nomadic um, 
School of Architecture in the case of the project of the computer uh, room. So you said in the beginning uh, that the, the community would say that the bamboo was something temporary and that maybe health is a material that can uh, go away with, uh, with, with the rains. So uh, did you find after the construction of, of the building that the community would, would change their mind or if this has been reproduced in, their, in the construction of their, of their houses? And at the same time, if we go to the academic background, how can, can we, I see, I know there's also a lot of students here. So how can we, um, let's say, relearn or de-learn what we have learned until now to be able to see uh, that in the vernacular encyclopedia there's also a building made with concrete blocks? Okay, thank thank you. you. I'm going to need some quick answers, <laughs> if that's okay. okay. Um, um, then we've got well, I really need to, quickly need to know did you, what, what's hard to deal with for me from who? Like, so for the for the but in terms of the people I'm working for, like yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. So I think what's really key about like the stuff that we did in the garden last year is that it's all super temporary. It's it's um, uh, so that structure, that tent that we made, um, you know, is isn't something that's going to impact people for a long time. But I, know I would say those chairs that we made, I think they're quite ugly, but. I saw in like um, uh, yeah Isaiah carrying it home really proudly, and someone else putting it in the office at the Albany. And there's a value in the joy and the the, 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 the process of making it. And for me, there's then also a beauty in it alongside its its crudeness. Um, but something I really talk about a lot with my students because if you're going to advocate for processes and them being valued, um, what's the relationship with the architecture that you get? And can there be a kind of pleasure in the architecture, seeing the pleasure of the process in the architecture? Um, it's just been a really fun conversation to have with students. Like, what's the relationship? Is it legible? Um, and I think often it is, and when it is, I think it can make quite beautiful and elegant things. And I think also there's difficult decisions about, this is a bit uglier or this isn't my taste, um, are really interesting things to wrestle with, and there isn't a right answer. But, um, yeah. Um, I've not spent enough time in, in the area where that computer lab was built, um, looking at the houses since, since we've built the computer lab, but I know that people were generally impressed with the strength of the bamboo, and um, I think the, ex the sort of hands-on experience of that material has given them a different idea of what they can do with it. Um, and I would say that in a different situation, I built a bamboo fence alongside lots of um, concrete post fences that had been built, and someone went along for because they were trying to disputing land and they went down went down the sort of land and and destroyed all the fences but they weren't allowed they weren't able to push the bamboo fence down um but they were able to topple all the concrete posts and and then you went back um about three or four weeks later and everyone had put bamboo fences in <laughs> where their concrete posts had been so it 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 does you know sort of seeing is believing and feeling something um, it gets people on board, so um, yeah, I think it's very powerful. Okay, um, right. Shall I? We we'll take that question and then we. Okay, can I guess it. mine is um, a little bit of uh, an observation, and I'm going to be super honest and open and say I'm coming from a really good place when I when I'm um, sharing this. But um, so, for example, I think there are power dynamics in everything we do and when we work overseas and even when we work with communities that are marginalized, even from Lewisham, for example, you know? Um, and Catriona, you working with Sierra Leone. It actually genuinely made me uncomfortable when you read out the questions that they were asking you, saying, you know, they only, you know, accept you or, you know, you're only allowed to do this because you're white, you know? And this is real. And I guess my provocation is because vernaculars have changed and there is a colonial history with, with things, I think we should look more towards things like what is like an ethical vernacular, do you know what I mean? And look at what are the ethics and intentions behind what we do and how do we balance those out and actually share those questions. So I'm actually really glad you said those questions, but I'm telling you it made me feel uncomfortable. And as someone who's British and of South Asian heritage, when I work with South Asia and my colleagues and people that I've worked with, 
I myself feel like because I'm British and I have an English accent, they actually put me on a pedestal too. And I actually say, no guys, equalize, like, don't do that, you know, what's your opinion? So I say, look, you know, tell me what you think, you know what I mean? Like, and it's really difficult to do when you feel you're part of that duality. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if, it, I don't have a question, but I'm saying like, I think it's a really important thing. And, and one way that I've found that will help everyone in that is the dialogue between us, right? And it's about making sure that your teams, your panels and everything are as balanced and diverse as possible. So when you're going into projects that you're doing this with, that you have a local stakeholder that is with you and even someone from the UK that, you know, you just need that balance because I, I do think that's representation. So I, I would just leave it at thinking about ethical vernacular. Okay. You know, I think we're going yeah, to stop I, there, but I'm going to give the floor to Yitago because I'm sure you've got something to add on the sort of ethics dimension as you're working such globally um, across sort of multiple continents, and I'm sure this comes up. Uh, yes, yeah, I mean, ethics and equity is uh, all those issues are, are uh, important aspect of all these large scale projects where we're implementing and for us it's about tradition norms respecting the culture and then making sure that we integrate available traditional ancestral knowledge with available science and innovation and combining that co-creating with the local communities at the way forward and that is what we have been doing so far okay well, thank you very much um i'm really sorry that was a great discussion but we're sort of out of time um, just to finally wrap up, I'm going to call on Harriet Gilmerk to... I, I just wanted to say that those questions also always made me feel extremely uncomfortable as well. And I think um, that, yeah, um, you know, how, how local is local when you come down to those things because um, I don't feel at all qualified in the end in designing buildings for, for people. Um, in those contexts. Neither do I think the Sierra Leonean architects there are, are qualified because, they're, because they've had to go abroad to study architecture. They're, they're not of the same um, situation as the people who are, are living in informal settlements. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the huge barriers is that um, um, people there perceive, oh, this, this is not for us because it's not come from our from our place which is one of which is the one of the main reasons why i would like to see more architects transferring their knowledge over to builders in those places so that they can design their own things good comment um very brief closing remarks from me which is to say so intbau obviously being a network of chapters and of over 8000 members and focused on traditional building architecture and urbanism there are a thousand different World Congress events that we could organize every time we set out to do one. Um, so this certainly always circling around the role that traditional building and architecture and almost its responsibility can be in helping to reduce the built environment's carbon footprint um, is one of those many possible that we could have held. So I hope the mix of views and perspectives we've had has been productive these last two days. The intention always just to get all of us thinking and talking to each other. And we will send around we, to everybody that's taken part just a, uh, a plea to add a thought or a reflection or an idea on how you think we might build from here, working with some structure that we can put together of some of the points that have come out of all the talks, these four sessions in two days. Um, so thanks to, to finish, thanks to all speakers, this session and the, and the previous three. Uh, thanks to our supporters and partners of the British Council, Adam Architecture, Ali Reza and Mina Sagarchi, Stanhope Gate Architecture and Yangu Architects. Huge thanks as well to Juliet and to Lauren who've put a huge amount of work in um, leading up to these two days and these last two days. <laughs> They've been brilliant to work with. And thanks to all participants both in this room and online. That's it. <laughs>